momentarily your video is on YouTube again. Yeah. Okay. Hey, I'd like to report that we met in camera and direction was given to staff. And the following motions are coming. Okay, anybody ready to move the motion? I'll move it. Moved by Councillor Tangley, well, second by Councillor Green. Any question on a motion? Councillor Rhino. Councillor Rhino, you're on. Just, just a question. Do the people in, in uh, uh, look looking at this through the internet? Do they get do they get to see the motion is read? Because if they don't, I do believe the motion should be read. Anybody can answer that? I'll read the motion if that's what you want. The, mo the, mo the motion's up on the screen. We are live streaming, so this what's on the screen can be seen. Can be seen? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay. I see no question. no question being called. We go to the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passed unanimously. Well, that will conclude our infrastructure and operation committee. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn and go for lunch. So move. So move. Move and second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, we are adjourned till what time? It's good. 1 30, 1 40. 1 30, good. 1 30. 1 30. Okay, we'll convene at 1 30. Don't have to drive for her. Oh.
I attempted my mine was uh, track and field and soccer, baseball. Yeah. Uh, Norville, the grade five class that I'm in, they're just about to embark on a um, a project. It's kind of a multicultural project, but uh, they're trying to relate to uh, different topics that the kids will relate to. So some of them are going to be sports oriented. And is was that an actual book that you just showed? Because I think that your uncle could be a great candidate for that. Yes, this is his book. It's a William Ray, uh, the forwards by Jerome McGinley. Oh, wow. Okay. It just goes over his life growing up at uh, 212 Charlotte Street. Many Maybe summers I'll touch spent. Many summers spent in New Brunswick. Yeah, I'll uh, touch base with you on that further. It should be in the library, or they can get it at a bookstore. Uh, anybody's okay. interested. It was uh, Indigo's uh, star pick of the month. Uh, not sure what month, but well, just where he's local, and also you're, you know, you've been in the school. It would be, uh, it would be great. Yeah. Okay, folks, you should be able to see the agenda. The break screen should be gone. We are live streaming. We're going to start the resume the recording so you can start the meeting at any any time you like, Wayne. Beverly, can you please start my video? I cannot start it. It said you have to start it. Okay. There, you should be able to now. Is there anybody else? And see Keith. <laughs> Keith's there. We can see Keith. And Tom. Okay, folks, we'll bring this uh, portion, your PAC portion to, to order, call the meeting to order. First, I'll be looking for approval of the minutes of December 14th, 2021. So moved. Seconded. Moved by Deputy Warden Mitchell, seconded by Councilor Hibb. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. First up, <laughs> we have the Portree JACC rezoning and redesignation of Mount Uniac. First reading, John. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you can see my screen there, now, Mr. Chair. We... Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is uh, an application uh, to go from rural use to uh, R2, a two dwelling unit residential, or it was <laughs> an application to go to R2. The applicant has since changed the request to go to R1. And that's actually why we're going back to first reading. We've previously given, or council had previously given it first reading. And a public information meeting was held uh, back in April. Um, and uh, this is the property outlined in orange here. So it borders the HRM boundary here on the white side, um, the Sackville River along here, South Uniac Road. And the surrounding zoning is mostly rural use, RU. There is a municipal property here, open space on the uh, Sackville River there. And uh, <clears throat> the property on the HRM side is zoned uh, what they call mixed resource MR1, <clears throat> which is fairly similar to our, uh, our U zone. Um, <clears throat> so the proposal is to um, change the designation and zoning to allow a 50 lot subdivision. Um, and there is a concept here. It should be noted that this is only a concept. It hasn't been reviewed under a subdivision bylaw yet, that would obviously happen uh, after any rezoning. Um, and again, it shows 50 lots. It, there is a large wetland in this area and there has also been no open space taken out of this. So it may not look exactly like this by the time they get through the subdivision application process, but it is a good idea of what a, a future subdivision there might look like. Um, in terms of policy, so the Mount Uniac Growth Management Area is fairly unique in that it allows this type of development, uh, unservice development, whereas the other growth management areas obviously rely on services, uh, municipal services. Um, <clears throat> the zone it's in, this property is in though, does not allow new roads, a rural use zone, so that's uh, the need for the redesignation and rezoning. Um, 
<clears throat> and because this is an MPS amendment involved in this application, council's decision is not appealable to the URB. What we've learned so far from reviewing agencies and our review, <clears throat> uh, firstly, the RCMP really have no concerns. They did comment on the proposed road extensions to the HRM boundary. Um, <clears throat> their concern there would be if those roads get extended in the future, there could be an issue with jurisdiction about how you get to that part of HRM. Um, although HRM commented that they don't have any concerns, but they also commented on those uh, roads terminating at the HRM boundary. And they noted that in their own regulations, they don't foresee any future roads in that area. So that might uh, negate the concern from the RCMP. Um, Nova Scotia Public Works are not requiring a traffic impact study for this application uh, and all their other comments related to the intersection location and drainage, which are issues that really get addressed at the subdivision stage. Similarly, East Hance Infrastructure and Operations um, commented on the road layout and that's really you know, an issue for the subdivision stage. The Sackville Rivers Association commented that the property about the Sackville River, they're simply reminding us that, uh, you know, any development has potential to do harm to a waterway. Um, they also point out the large wetland complex on the property. Um, they're also hopeful that the watercourse greenbelt zone remains undeveloped. And they're also hopeful that it actually comes into public ownership as a result of the application to allow uh, what they envision as a future river conservation corridor trail that that would go from HRM into East Hans. Um, so the watercourse greenbelt portion of this property is not proposed to be re rezoned as part of this application. It would stay watercourse greenbelt. And how much of that um, uh, land comes into public ownership? That's really, I guess, um, through the subdivision process. Uh, East Hans Parks Rock and Culture commented that. Um, um, you know, they may be interested in acquiring some of that land if there's a trail network that it could connect to from HRM. So that would be, again, something that would happen at the subdivision stage. In terms of hydrogeology, um, uh, the applicant engaged Earthwater Concepts Inc., uh, uh, Richard Gagne, um, to conduct a level one groundwater assessment for the proposed development. And the report actually recommends that they go on and do a level two assessment, um, but he also said that he didn't expect any issues with quantity or quality of water on this site. <clears throat> he, in fact, he suggested that even using very conservative um, uh, estimate, there's a potential for 500 additional dwellings within the groundwater recharge area that this development is in. And, you know, this is proposing 50 dwellings. So, you know, quite, quite a bit uh, less than even that conservative estimate. The, the consultant's main concern is really with well interference within the new subdivision if wells are put too close together, but that's really a concern anywhere. I don't think it's specific to this site. Um, <clears throat> and I, because of that recommendation for level two, I did call the consultant, had a conversation with him. Um, but after that conversation, I'm pretty satisfied that he's comfortable that there's enough water or they're highly probable that there's enough water in this recharge area for these 50 dwelling units. <clears throat> The, um, the only reason he recommended that level two is because of where glacial till is on the property. There's a lot of soil, more soil in the southern portion. <clears throat> so it's more difficult for him to get a read on the geology. It's the only reason that he recommended the level two. So in terms of citizen engagement, we do the normal advertising. Um, and again, I, I mentioned a public information meeting was already held. <clears throat> Uh, issues that came up there were the condition of the South Uniac Road and Bridge, uh, impact on development on property taxes, <clears throat> the environmental impact on the Sackville River wetlands and wells, uh, all addressed. And a survey was also circulated to uh, about 50 property owners within 500 meter um, setback. Council directed us to go 500 meters instead of 300 meters, uh, so we did that. And we only got three responses though. And they also talked about things like traffic and safety on the South Uniac and Etta Roads. Um, <clears throat> one, one of the um, respondents objected to the R2 zoning talking about that would could potentially double density. Well, if we're going to R1, that's obviously no longer an issue. And also had concerns with accessing child care for school aged children with additional population saying that's a challenge in the area now. And also commented on the lack of municipal services in the area. So if a public hearing is approved, uh, staff will again circulate to all property owners within 500 meters. Um, 
Now my chart here is is a little bit mixed up because we're really at this stage. We, we've done the questionnaire, held the PIM, and got comments from reviewing agencies, but we have to go back to first reading because again, we're, we're going to an R1 instead of an R2. Um, but you know, you would consider that a down zoning. So if you had any concerns with the impact of R2, surely you would have expressed them with that as opposed to R1. So staff aren't proposing that we go do another questionnaire or go back to the reviewing agencies that we now move on to a public hearing uh, following first reading. So that is the recommendation, Mr. Chair, that first reading be first reading be given and that staff be authorized to schedule a public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, John. Any discussion? Is anybody prepared to move the recommended motion? Sam, I'll move the re Are you moving the motion, Sam? Yes. We have yes. a seconder. I second it. Okay, moved by uh, uh, Mr. Balcom and seconded by Eli. Any discussion? Councillor Perry. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Through 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 you to staff, John. There's been considerable uh, conversation about the safety of of that bridge in South Uniac, and we've actually written to two, I believe it was TIR before, and I, I don't know if we sent another letter to Public Works, because recently they just did a resurfacing, uh, uh, not a deep resurfacing, uh, uh, a casual glide across of uh, parts of the South Uniac Road, which if you drive down it, uh, well, not today, it's all covered in ice, but early parts of the winter, it was already starting to fall apart again. Um, is, is there any way to ask, um, public works to take a look at that bridge because there, there, there was safety concerns and I I even think that when our people drove by and looked at it there, there was some concerns by our own people about about the safety of that bridge long term. Uh, yeah, I'm going to throw if, if it's okay Mr. Chair uh, let Jesse answer that. <clears throat> uh, through Mr. Chair the uh, oh. yeah the bridge in question staff had gone out and looked at the bridge, there had been evident um, at the very least topical damage with the uh, sides being poshed off to the side. Um, when we last went and looked at it, we, we sent comments to the province, provincial staff, um, uh, with concerns and requested them follow up and, and investigate the area. They commented that they have done that, but have not sent us any documents stating the future plans for that structure at this time. So um, uh, if further information such as that was of interest, um, staff could pursue that from the province and post on council chambers online if that was uh, a will of executive committee and then council. Thank you, Jesse. No, I just wanted to make it known, like we've done everything we can at the municipality to try and address that bridge uh, in talking to the province because it is a provincial road and we don't own it or have control over it. So. Um, I know some of the residents uh, that their concern, whether this subdivision goes in or not, is really not a concern to them. Their, their main concern is still uh, the safety of that bridge because it is a dead end road. It, it, it butts off onto um, the uh, trailer park back there. So, you know, if that bridge goes out, there's a lot of people that can be cut off. So um, I'm, I was a little perplexed why there'd be no traffic study or anything done by public works on the road or, or, or required ahead of time, because I imagine part of that traffic study would be, or, or assessment would be the road conditions. So that, that's all I have, just making those comments that uh, I know we had looked at it and we we had forwarded stuff on and I guess we didn't hear anything back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, John, can you, can you refresh me on the South Uniac Road? Because there's already over 200 units down there but with the trailer park and stuff and only one access to it so what's the difference between that and another subdivision that we request that they have two access when they reach 100 units uh, through you mr chair well it's it's the same principle but um for example uh, subdivisions in the corridor need two two access but they they can both come out onto highway two so it's not really any different it's it's just another arterial road that they're coming out onto yeah, but if one if one access if, if that access if the bridge fail and stuff, there are going to be a lot of people stuck. 
uh, and could be life and death for, for for some people if there's an emergency, right? So I don't know. I, I'm not going to oppose this project because of that, but something should be done about that. Any more discussion? Be looking for the question. Question. Question has been called. We'll go to the vote. All in favor? Aye. And the motion is passed unanimously. Okay, next up, we have Road Gap Project 2. Tippy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in the spring of 2010, staff prepared a list of publicly owned unpaved gap and dead end roads within the South Corridor and commercial growth management area. These roads were determined to be unlikely to pass the petition process via bylaw F100, local improvement bylaw, as individual petitions, because paving such small sections of road would amount to high costs for a small number of property owners. At that point in time, council moved that all roads identified be petitioned as one. A petition was carried out in the spring of 2011, but it was unsuccessful. In June of 2021, council made a motion directing staff to prepare a report regarding road gaps for further discussion at a future executive meeting. So staff have identified 21 sections of unpaved publicly owned road within the SCC GMA. Eight of those are municipally owned and 13 provincially owned. Of the 21, nine are considered true gap roads. So those are roads that fall between sections of roads. And the remaining 12 unpaved sections are short dead end roads. Staff are recommending that council proceed with the local improvement at their discretion via section 9.1 of the bylaw without a petition. And just as a note, a local improvement may not be imposed by council for a period of three years after a failed petition. And the most recent petition was carried out and failed in November of 2019. So no local improvement charges may be applied until November of 2022. So in a typical uh, petition process, the distribution of costs looks like this. The province usually contributes 50% of the cost of paving roads that they own upon request. The municipality usually contributes 10% of the cost of paving municipally owned roads as per the bylaw. And the remaining costs are paid by the property owners with direct frontage on the affected road. In this scenario, we're proposing to do things a little bit differently. Um, so the province would contribute 50% of the cost of paving provincially owned roads with uh, the lump sum contribution being applied to the overall project. The municipality contributing a lump sum of $150,000 towards the overall project. And this number is based on available funds currently in reserve identified by the Department of Finance. And then the remaining costs would be proposed to be divided amongst taxpayers who may directly and or indirectly benefit from the paving of the gap roads. And staff have identified four possible taxpayer charge categories. So those are the following. Charge category one would be those properties that have direct or dual access to an identified unpaved road to be charged an amount close to what has been paid by property owners for similar local improvements in the past. Charge category two is properties with indirect access to an identified unpaved road to be charged an amount less than category one, but more than three and four. Charge category three are properties with either alternative access, but with frontage on an identified unpaved road, or those in the neighborhood that would likely benefit from the paving. They're to be charged an amount less than one and two, but more than four. And this category includes an estimated number of new lots for the two bulk land parcels owned and developed by Seven Lakes Development Group in Lands. And their cost share is estimated to be about 45,000 to 65,000. And then category four is all the other properties within the SCC GMA to be charged no more than 75 to hundred dollars. And just to give you a little more clarity, here's a picture of each of the categories. So category one is that direct and dual access. This property has direct um, driveway access onto Keys Lane, which is an identified unpaved road, but they also have a driveway onto this already paved road. So they, they fall into that dual access category. The indirect access category are like these properties on Alder 
Um, they are on a paved road, but they have to cross this unpaved section of Hazelwood in order to get out of their subdivision. The alternative um, and likely benefit categories are those that are maybe on a corner of an unpaved section, but they access onto a paved section, or they're in the neighborhood where it's likely that they'll use these unpaved roads to, to exit their subdivision, but not necessarily have. And then the final category here, you just see the rest of the properties that would be in the South Corridor Commercial Growth Management Area. And here's just another map um, showing a breakdown, the properties that are identified as direct or dual access in red, indirect access as yellow, alternative access likely benefit in green, and the rest of the properties um, in the South Corridor Commercial GMA in blue. So we've prepared uh, two scenarios for carrying out the local improvement for your consideration. One here, fire department. Scenario one includes all 21 of the identified roads, so that's gap and dead end, and all four charge categories. Scenario two includes only the true gap roads, of which there are nine, and two dead end roads, Mackenzie Lane and West Court. And in this scenario, um, we're only considering the first three charge categories. So Mackenzie Lane and West Court are proposed to be included in scenario two, because unlike the other dead end unpaved roads identified, these two are part of comprehensive subdivisions that are otherwise already entirely paved or would be if the local improvement proceeds. They're also um, the only two municipally owned dead end unpaved roads. Alternatively, council may choose to petition these two roads separately to see if there's interest from the property owners in joining the combined local improvement. So here's a cost breakdown of both scenarios. Again, scenario one includes all of the roads and all four charge categories. Scenario two, just the gap roads plus Mackenzie and West and three charge types. So in this column here, you have the total cost of the entire project. The provincial contribution in scenario one amounts to about 27% of the cost. The $150,000 allotted from the municipality is about 9% and the remaining 65 of the total for the taxpayer. Um, and then broken down by these percentages as follows, you'll see in this middle column here, this is approximately what um, the cost to each property owner would be depending on what category they fell in. So again, we have um, category one above that 3000 mark and it trickling down to category four at $90. And then in scenario two, we just remove that category four so it, um, and, and the other roads. So the total is less and you'll see a drop in the provincial contribution, an increase in the municipal contribution and the cost per property here. So all costs are approximate and will be updated at the time of the local improvement. The taxpayer charges for categories one, two, and three may be paid over a period of 10 years plus interest if desired. The taxpayer charge category uh, charge for category four in scenario one is proposed to be a one-time payment. The distribution of taxpayers contribution amongst the different charge categories is not fixed and may be adjusted, but is generally suggested to follow the following formula. So category one at about 60 to 70%, category two, three to five, category three, 15 to 30%, and if category four is included, about 15 to 20%. Staff are recommending scenario two, where only the true gap roads plus Mackenzie Lane and West Court are included, and only the first three categories are charged. Scenario one is not recommended for the following reasons. The short unpaved dead end roads included in scenario one are not likely to benefit the wider community. Staff recommend the provincially owned sections, so that's all but Mackenzie and West, be paved by the province and taken over by the municipality. And including all properties in the SCC GMA as in scenario one places a burden on staff to allocate and manage the proposed charges for a large number of tax accounts and a financial burden on those taxpayers who may never benefit from paving these roads uh, to help cover the cost. So the recommendation from staff is that Planning Advisory Committee recommend that Council authorize staff to proceed with this local improvement on the basis of Scenario 2, and that staff be directed to draft an amendment to the local improvement bylaw, and that the road gap project be included in the 
2022-26 capital budget for construction in 2023. Thank you. Warden Rolston. Thank you. Um, just a bit of a question. Um, traditionally, the municipality would pay 10% of the cost of paving municipal roads. Um, in both scenarios here, the municipality is shown as uh, paying $150,000 lump sum. I'm just curious, that's significantly over the 10% mark, and that's for all these roads, whether they're provincial or municipal. Um, I guess I'm looking for some justification for that, and I'm looking to see where this money's coming from. And I'm thinking that most of these roads are not in the rural area, probably none of them, of the municipality. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, I'm wondering if um, the Director of Finance might be able to comment on the, the reserve funds. Sure, through the Chair. Um, so currently we have just over 300,000 in a reserve that's specific to contribute to paving projects that council has <coughs> set aside. So um, when we were considering this to bring forward to council, we were looking to um, see if council would consider a, more than the 10% in order to get this particular project into completion where there's so many different, just odds and sods, small pieces that are not paved right now um, throughout various areas that have been demonstrated on the mapping system. So that was what um, we were proposing in this particular gap project. Go ahead, Warden. So we would be paying 10% on all of these gap roads, including the provincial ones for which the province is already paying 50%, correct? Through yeah. you, Miss, sorry, go ahead, Sue. No, go ahead, go ahead, Timmy. <laughs> I, I was just gonna point to the, the chart here, yes. The, the idea is that um, the provincial contribution and the municipal contribution would be distributed over all of the roads within the the improvement. Okay. And this road reserve comes from general rate? Correct, it's a transportation reserve. Okay. And I understand, you know, that this is probably the only way that we're going to make this project happen. I guess, um, My concern is with the difficulty and near impossibility of getting gravel roads, most of which are provincially owned, paved in the rural area of this municipality. And uh, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Councillor Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff. Um, under this, taking it from the reserve, uh, how much would be left in the reserve? Through the chair, there would just there would be roughly um, just over 150. We took just less than half of what's in the reserve. So, so it'd be roughly 50%. Uh, right. No, I'm just like um, I understand the need for this to happen. Um, the other thing is, we do have a lot of municipal roads uh, that we are taking over, and we are. We are, you know, our business park expansion, all those roads we own as well. And those, uh, the maintenance costs are not going down. Um, they're only gonna go up. So I'm just, you know, $150,000 doesn't go a long way when you get into paving large sections of roads. So um, I'm a little concerned with the uh, health of that reserve at this point, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll think about it. Thank you. I had Sue. Um, through the chair. Um, so just so there's a full understanding, this particular reserve is just set aside for paving um, roads like this for a local improvement. There's other reserves um, and um, different types of financing for the repaving of the roads that we currently own. Does that help? 
ahead, Councilor Perry. Um, yeah, it does. It, it also brings up another question. Like, there's been a lot of petitions uh, by a lot of people to pave gravel roads, um, and a lot of them fail because of the cost. And and it's it's kind of, you know, makes me question. Like, you know, did they know that they could have applied for reserve funding to assist in that road to be paved to lower their costs, like we're going to do for for these sections of road um, here? It's uh, it's a equitable thing for me is, you know, is, is that, is it fair that we're going to assist them? Because, you know, uh, uh, you know, we stopped paying years, years ago when the provincial road was paved, you would have, it, it's exactly how it was here. The province paid 50 and the municipality paid 10. Thank goodness we stopped uh, paying 10% on the provincial road. Um, but, you know, there's, it, it's just going to raise questions in other areas outside the corridor where it will look like, you know, more stuff is being done there than anywhere else. That's that's the that's not that can be the perception. That's not what I believe is happening. But I don't want to have that, you know, be the perception of people. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Barry. Where's Sue? I see um, the CAO also has her hand up. Uh, did you want to go first, Kim? Or um, I was, you, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I was just going, when we do a petition for paving, that 10% for a municipal road would be included in the numbers that people are considering. Um, we did go with the 150000 here just because there needs to be some incentive if council wants to get this these road gaps paved. Um, and the, the folks who live on these roads, there's very few of them that, um, or some of these roads, I guess, a lot of the people don't even drive over them. So they're not going to sign a petition or there might only be two or three people to sign the petition. Um, if council wants to drop that to 60,000 or 10% of the project, they can certainly do that. It just redistributes the funds over um, under you know, the, the scenario two, you're gonna be looking maybe at, um, you know, instead of 165, maybe it's a, a charge of, $300 for the scenario three or however that plays out in the numbers, but council can certainly do that. Um, but the, the reserve that was set aside is specifically for this petition type paving. Thank you, Kim. Councillor Tingley. Can I confirm what streets we're talking about here? Uh, the other seven? Where you got me down here. Through you, Mr. Chair, you can see, I don't know if you can read those on um, the map there. So we've got Locks Road, Bakery Lane, Shawnalee Lane, Boyd Avenue, Wilson Road, Donaldson Avenue, Mackenzie Court, West Court, Brook Court, Horn Road, Miller Road, School Road, Keys Lane, Mariah Drive, Book, Brookside Avenue, Carla Don, Acorn Avenue, Hazelwood Avenue, Eisner Road, Green Road Extension, and Martin Court. And those would be all, all in scenario one. Um, the ones that are removed from scenario two are, are these ones that you mostly see in the middle here and at the south side that aren't part of the comprehensive subdivisions. And then Bakery Lane would be removed as well. So the, uh, I'm just trying to understand here. So the, 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 these roads that were listed in Lance, they're included in it, like Keys, Brookside. Yeah, okay. Um, these streets, like Lance is, well, all of the corridor area is basically an urban area. Uh, and these streets have been um, dirt uh, for 20 years or, or maybe more in some cases. And um, I, I don't see any other way of getting them paved other than to, to do something like this. Now, I don't know whether we want to uh, allow 10% or $150,000 or whatever. Like I'd certainly, I'm, obviously I'd be fine with the $150,000 because some of this is in, in District 7. But, um, you know, a lot of these people have waited 20 years to get something done here. Uh, some of the streets, there's... Uh, like somebody else mentioned, there's few houses on, so there, there's 
not as many uh, taxpayers to cover the costs. Um, I, I'm going to make a motion that we uh, uh, go with uh, this motion as, as it's presented. Hey, do we have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Hebb. There's quite a few on here before you all have leeway to speak. Uh, Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so those people have been petitioned so many times and they don't want their street paved. And, and now we're gonna give them more money to, 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 to help them to get those street paved. So we have the same thing here on Lake Rest Drive and be prepared for another 150,000 to cover that if you wanna give one side 10% because another 10% on the top of the 50% on Lake Crest could pass the petition too. So if we want to do it in one part of the municipality, we better be prepared to do it in everywhere. Thank you. Councillor. Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we just have to remember that we're just referring to these gap roads. I mean, like I've got a lot of subdivisions in well, it definitely in uh, in District 10 in Enfield that have dirt roads, but we're not considering repaving roads like that. We're just talking about gap roads that have unfortunately fell between two paved sections because of the way things went between developments that happened. Um, I definitely uh, would be more interested in the second option of just just the gap roads and the two uh, cul-de-sacs that result result from that. But I am interested if maybe Jesse might be able to weigh in on this. Um, do you have any kind of figures for what it costs to grade and uh, maintain these gap roads annually, Jesse? I know my residents are crying for the for the potholes to be filled. Uh, seems like every other month, at least. Uh, yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, I don't I don't have exact figures, but I can give you I can give you generalized costs uh, or comments on that. So through through the service corridor area, um, there's increased traffic to, on gravel roads versus you would see it elsewhere that, especially when you're tied into subdivisions. So you see a higher increase in potholes, especially at intersections where there's stops and starts. Um, there's a few famous ones for just major wear and tear. Boyd and Wilson is one of them. Um, Brookside in general is just an interconnection of the entire subdivision and Lance uh, that has had historical issues as well. The, co the, the cost to build a gravel road is cheaper. The cost to maintain year over year is, is more expensive and it's variable. It's really hard to predict. So things that can happen is, especially in Nova Scotia, where we dance around the freezing mark and the freeze thaw, um, you can really do some damage on gravel roads. And in serviced areas, um, it, we experience more significant damage than we would on just repairing just the gravel sections. We uh, had an incident in Lance where two manholes were hit in the last two weeks, um, hit right off. And then there's a wide opening and, and we, and there's action required. There's, there's just more things, right? The, the, the road goes up and down because of the freeze thaw, the manholes do not. And so, um, there's just unique cost triggers that, that occur, um, along these gap sections. Uh, they're hard to predict, um, but they never go away in the in the current condition. I guess I was just trying to get an idea of you know the money that we are putting out on these year yeah. after year to try and maintain these gap roads. Um, and I think the thing about these true gap roads is that if we could get them cleaned up, I it's my understanding that would be the end of them, right? That that circumstance will not will not happen going forward in our municipality. I. Mr. Chair, maybe I could comment on that. Um, certainly in the serviced areas, our standard has changed. So any new subdivisions have to have paved roads. So yeah, you, you won't get any more of these in the serviced areas. Okay, so by cleaning them up, then that would put an end to this whole gap road, uh, you know, that we've been uh, that we've been hearing about year, year, year after year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mitchell. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, sitting here thinking, I think the long-term plan, if I'm understanding it right, is to get rid of all the gravel roads in the uh, growth managed area over time. Am I uh, hearing that right? Well, the, yeah. for you, Mr. Chair, that would be scenario one, and that's not what we're recommending just because of the increased cost and the the lack of benefit to the wider community, I guess. So it's it's more, so no, this project doesn't get rid of all of them. So it gets rid of all the gaps, but not all the gravel roads. How many would be left uh, following the scenario that you're presenting? Do you wanna go back to the map, Tippy? Yeah, I'm just gonna go. So there, there were 21 roads in um, scenario one. Um, and then in scenario two, it was 11. So there would be 10 roads left. So Mackenzie Lane and West Court, were they, are they, they be paved? They're being proposed um, in scenario two, yes. Okay. And that cost would go to the residents? Through you, Mr. Chair. It, yeah, it would be broken down as seen in scenario two here. Okay. Uh, I don't see any benefit on on the subdivision that surrounds West Court that they would use West Court since it's a cul-de-sac and they would have to go in and come out just for the sake of driving on it. Um, so there's still gonna be uh, gravel roads left over when, when this project is uh, presented and completed. It's yes, Mr. Chair, there, there would be. But, but, um, just a, a point of clarification, Mr. Chair. The West Court is really the anomaly. So if you look at the map on the screen, yes. the, the properties in Lance subdivision beyond the roads in question would all contribute a small amount towards the project. Mm -hmm. But the people in the Elmwood subdivision would not because right. West Court is at the back of that subdivision. Um, it's really an anomaly. There's nobody in that subdivision that would benefit from any of these roads being paved. So West Court would, the people in Elmwood wouldn't be subject to that charge. What, what about Brook Court? It's a provincial road. It's, I see it's on the, the map here. Would those costs be passed on to the homeowners? For you, Mr. Chair, it, so this map is showing all 21 roads. Right. So. This would include, if we were doing scenario one with all the roads, including Brook Court, then yes, the proposal is to include that category four, which would be everything in blue here in the, the corridor commercial growth management area. But if, if we're looking at scenario two, then Brook Court isn't included. Now I'm just thinking about a way how do we get rid of the, dirt, the gravel roads over time, that's all to the betterment so, of the municipality. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Rhino. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for me, this report lacks the visualization. Uh, the look at a map that is so small and uh, is for me very hard. I would have appreciated either uh, photos or a video, but obviously we didn't get that. My question is this, municipal portion, where does, did we establish that transportation fund? Did we establish if that was a general fund or coming from another area? Mr. Chair, Go ahead, so, Sue. so that particular reserve is on the general tax rate because it falls under transportation and roads are under that. Well, I can see maintaining roads and costing of roads and everybody paying for them for, uh, for business parks because there's a shared benefit for everybody. But it's gonna be some hard for me to explain to a person, let's say uh, on the many gravel roads that I have, that a portion of the taxes they've been paid over the years will be going to uh, pave in these gap roads in another area, knowing full well that they will never see any 
pavement uh, on their own gravel road. So that makes it some very difficult for uh, as a counselor for, for me. For me. So uh, I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rhino. Warden Rolston. Yeah, following along on the discussion, if it was just the 10% that the municipality traditionally always pays towards road paving projects, it would be much simpler. Um, and I understand the, the comp that we wanted to provide some incentive, but we don't need to provide any incentive for this. This is not something we're petitioning. This is something we're imposing. And we're telling the people, this is what we're going to do and you're going to pay for it. So, you know, I, I, I don't get any incentive value there. I do agree that this is a good project and it needs to be done. But, and maybe I missed it in prior discussions or that, I wasn't aware that we were going to significantly increase the municipal contribution to that. And if we're going to do that, then as Councillor Musa has said, we need to be prepared to increase municipal contributions in roads in other areas. And I just, I get roundly scolded over roads much more often than I ever did now, even though they're provincial roads, people don't really care. So, you know, when I'm able to truthfully explain the situation and the ownership of the roads and that municipal tax dollars, you know, I can explain that. So as Councillor Rhino says, this would be a little more difficult to explain and it's not huge dollars, but I look at all of the other residents in the corridor area, in this area even, who petitioned and paid to have their roads paved based on the payment formula that we have. So now some of these folks are being told, we're gonna pave up the gaps and that's a great thing not only are you gonna to have to pay because you might have an indirect benefit, but you're also gonna pay again because we're giving a much larger, I mean, when I look at the cost of the uh, whole project, 10% of it would be 60,000, but that's on the whole project, that's not on municipal roads in the project. So you might be able to sell me on 10% of the whole project even as a one-time thing. I'm having trouble with the 25%. Um, I'm just trying, and I know it's a good project. I know it should be done, but it's, it's a tough sell. And at the end of the day, when I explain how roads work in East Hants and how they're paid for, I like to be consistent. Thank you. Thank you, Warden. All right, the warden Rolston was the last on before the motion was made. All discussion now will be directed towards the motion. Councillor Musa, towards the motion. You're muted, Councillor. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, John, uh, do we have uh, any other gravel road in the in the corridor area that possibly people are gonna be able to subdivide lot past them like and pave, so the gap is gonna stay. So if you have a gravel road and you put and you wanna put a new subdivision of that gravel road, you're gonna you're gonna create another gap, right? Is that possible? Uh, I know it's possible it's in possible. Montpelier. Uh, I haven't really looked at the. Yeah, I guess there are some of those roads you might be able to create additional lots. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you can, you're not gonna get rid of all the gaps. So, so we're gonna have another. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna deal with that problem all the time. And if we are gonna keep keep giving twenty five percent on every road that's gonna be a gap, that's gonna be a problem too. Plus, one more thing. I think 
when the corridor takes 75% of the gas tax for infrastructure, those roads are part of the infrastructure. So I think the gas tax is more appropriate to take money from to fix those if you want to do it this way. Because that, that was the reason why the corridor takes 75%. I don't know. I wasn't there, but probably the warden can comment on that. Through you, Mr. Chair, could I just, um, I think the only, there's no municipal scenario, and John can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no municipal scenario where we create another gap by extending a road. Any roads that would be left over would be provincial roads that are unpaved that may be able to be expanded. Is that a true um, statement? Well, through you, Mr. Chair, I mean, I was just looking at the map quickly, looking at land off of Eisner Road, Bakery Lane, um, I'm not sure where else you could still create lots, but it looks like those roads, there would be some land where you could create lots. Um, and those, yes, both of those are, are provincial. Right. Thank you, uh, Councillor Head. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to the motion. Um, I certainly would have preferred a list of the roads being done. Uh, this map, in my bad ad side is just a blur of a few lines. Uh, having worked for DOT, I know where a lot of them are, but but I would uh, have preferred to have a list of exactly you know what area they're in. Having said that, it says the scenario that there's uh, two dead end roads to be paid. What roads would they be? Through you, Mr. Chair, in scenario two, it's um, Mackenzie Lane and West Court. So. And looking at the map, West Court is here. It's this cul-de-sac at the back of the Elmwood subdivision. And McKen Mackenzie Lane is just off of Boyd Avenue. Okay. And, um, and the list of roads were in the staff report as well. Gosh, I think I read it, but I didn't see any list of roads, but maybe I didn't go far enough, I guess. Uh, my fault. Um, Bakery Lane is a provincial road. And personally, I don't see any need to pay that. Uh, people's been driving in and out that road for years, and if they don't, if they want to pay, they should have to pay for it. I don't think community. I think we should be looking more at the road gaps than anything else. Um, Eisner Road, is that the Eisner Road in Lance? It yes. is. Okay, well, that's a half a kilometer, and that's a provincial road. That's always been gravel ever since I've been around. I can't see why we should have to contribute to paying pavement for that. Uh, there's no road gap there. Um, I see you, Kim, but I just have another one. Miller Road. Is that the one in Elmsdale? Yes. And that's another road. That's a provincial road. It's short and it's not a road gap. The people have been going there for years. There's only a few houses up there. I don't think we should be doing these provincial roads that are dead end. Um, the road gaps to me is a is the ones that need to be done. And I'll give you a good example. I think it's Shauna Lee that goes from uh, uh, um, Boyd Avenue through to, to uh, Alderney Drive. And there's four houses on that. Uh, two of the houses have an exit driveway onto that, which is never used. But there's a set of mailboxes there. And that, that's just a crossroad between these two roads. And here these people have to pay for a road that the majority of people from that subdivision use because of the mailboxes that are there. And uh, I, I know from Graydon that years ago, it, it, it gets extremely rough there. And I understand the frustrations there, but they have these four houses, you know, pay for that little section road, which not, none of them ever use. So there's all kinds of holes in this. And I, I think we're paving too many provincial roads. I think that should be, and especially these dead end roads. I think we should stick to the road gaps that are there. Those are the ones that different people use. And, and uh, uh, as, as, as far as the extra money, I. I, I kind of look at that as, as, as a give and take, and I know the rural residents not going to agree with that, but sometimes we got to give up to make the better of the whole municipality. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Go ahead, Kim. Just um, to, to ensure that we're on the same page, the motion on the table would include only those roads that are true gap roads. So the motion that you're speaking to wouldn't include Eisner, um, Miller, whichever other one you Thank had mentioned. You it, it's truly the ones that are inside those subdivisions. So Shauna Lee is a provincial road, but it would be included because it truly is a gap in the middle of the subdivision. 
So that's the motion on the table is to not pay for those provincial dead end roads that are going off your main arteries. Good, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Tingley. Uh, yeah, again, I, I don't think this is a, a situation where it's uh, rural against uh, the urban part of East Hants. It sounds like we're getting in a little debate about um, one area getting 10% and one getting a little bit more. Um, I think everything is situational. Uh, this particular situation, uh, I know a, a lot about some of these road gaps because they're, they're, a lot of them are in my district. Um, and they're, they're roads that have been petitioned. They tried to get them paved in the past. There's only maybe one or two, a few homes where on the unpaved section. And those people would not, they couldn't get enough to agree on the petition. So they couldn't, could never get them paved. And those people get to enjoy the rest of the roads that are paved that other people have already paid for. Uh, this is one way to just get this resolved. I, and, you know, you might vote to go for 10%. I don't know on this. I think it would be reasonable to allow the 150 lump sum in this situation. And if I was looking at uh, uh, Councillor Musa mentioned a place in Lakeside or somewhere, if, if that situation uh, requires the same kind of uh, a, a, a resolution, I would be for something like that as well. But uh, in this case, uh, this has got to be done at some point in time. Uh, and it's been uh, at a checkmate for a long time. Um, staff has come up with a, a recommendation. It looks like it's been worked on since 2010. Um, these people have been waiting for 20 to 25 years to get this resolved. I think it's time to put it to bed. Thank you, Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, wondering about the 150,000 versus the 10%. I know that there is a motion and, I, and I, I'm glad you clarified that because I was actually thinking that the motion was for option one, which I, I yeah, I was concerned about that. So the emotion is for option two. But in looking at that, maybe people would be more um, accepting of this if it was down to a different percentage or 10% versus the 150. You know, is this something that if it doesn't pass, it's something that we can revamp the numbers or what, you know, just, just to uh, come to some you know, to some agreement on how we might be able to get these gap roads cleared up. Thank you. You want to speak to that, Kim? Uh, certainly. Um, so council can can deal with this motion. If the result is um, a, a failed motion, then you can ask for us to come back with different scenarios on the gap project. And we can certainly put those together um, because it is a project that uh, needs to be done. Um, whether it's a different percentage from municipality or, um, you know, maybe just a more comprehensive look at just the one scenario that you want to, to work through, we can do that. Thank you. Any more discussion on the motion? Councillor Perry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. T towards the motion, I, I will not be able to support the motion because 25% of a total project cost goes against our policies. Uh, we have a policy of 10%. I would be willing to accept a 10% of a total project cost, which would be more than what would be normally be contributed on a 10% road because we are going to be doing this for provincial roads. So it would be extra. Uh, it's coming from the general tax fund. These roads have been petitioned, uh, as Mr. Tingley has said, for 20 years. There are many roads throughout the whole municipality that have been petitioned for 20 years that fail for the same reason. And the other side, the other reason why I, I, I'm apprehensive to support this is because of all those failed petitions. These people have said they don't want it. Now we're going to enforce an extra cost on them uh, at this current time. Uh, I think, you know, I don't know their economic situation and I, you know, I hope they're all doing well. But getting a, a bill for $3,000, whether you're going to pay it over 10 years with interest or not, is still a bill for $3,000 that's being mandated on you. So for that, I won't support the motion as written. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just wondering if if uh, I if the uh, 
um, Councillor Tingley who made the motion, if it might be appropriate to amend the motion that's on the floor. Uh, well, I'm going to leave it as it is. And okay. if, you, if you want to vote it down, uh, you know, maybe we can look at something else, else afterward. But uh, I think it's very reasonable what's on the floor here. And if anybody went in these subdivisions and looked at the situation, it'd be like having a, a, a dirt road partway down Barrington Street in Halifax. Uh, it's just ridiculous. And uh, there's got to be a solution to it. A lot of people do want it resolved. I've had a lot of calls in my short time of being on council asking to, to get this resolved. Um, you know, and it, it, a lot of work has already been done on it. Uh, this argument over whether it's 60,000 or 150,000, uh, it just doesn't seem reasonable to me, but uh, we'll have a vote on it. And if you want to vote it down, vote it down. And I'll remind council that all discussion goes through the chair. It's just not free reign. Warden Rolston. Thank you. Uh, I would just say, had there been some consultation on, you know, prior to, to, um, making an exception to the policy and increase amount for this, that might have helped because perhaps we could have come to some agreement that yes, we could do this for this project on the caveat that if we did this, that this would be available or that would be available elsewhere. But it's, it's extremely difficult when you answer to residents and uh, even if they're not municipal roads, residents like to talk about roads. And as I said, I like being able to be consistent in what I tell them when I answer their questions. So for that reason, I'm going to move an amendment to the motion, which removes the $150,000 lump sum and replaces it with 10% municipal cost and with the remaining costs being reallocated among the other partners in the project. We have a seconder for the amendment. Second. Seconded by Councillor Musa. Keith, you were on before, you can have free reign to speak. Uh, just a couple of things on that. Is the motion in order because it takes away from the original intent of the motion? Uh, so that would be my first question. Uh, All it's doing really is changing the costing of it, not really the original intent. The intent is the original, to pave the gaps. But if I'm, I may, Mr. Motion, I'm going to let the motion proceed, the amendment proceed. I don't okay. see it change. I don't see it changing the whole intent of the motion. Okay, hey, I have to abide by your rules. I don't agree with it. But anyway, uh, I'm going to vote against the motion. And uh, for previously stated the reasons, and and, I, and I'm hoping that uh, that uh, Councillor Tingley did not uh, think uh, uh, mean to say that anybody on gravel road is ridiculous, or the gravel roads in any area is ridiculous. I hope he didn't mean to say that. But I do invite if you know anyone out there to to uh, come with me and try to explain to my residents that you know this is what we're doing. So rural urban, it doesn't matter. It's just, uh, just the fairness of it. And I invite any councillor to try to explain that to some of my residents who live on gravel roads. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. Councillor Lockwood. Okay, can you um, uh, say the motion over again? I must have missed something there. <sighs> well, the recommended motion is on the screen, councillor. Yes. And the change being made is instead of a lump sum $150,000 payment, it would be 10%, which would be, a, would be approximately $60,000. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Tingley. Uh, I, I'm off mute now, am I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I am not uh, pitting uh, Ur to, to Keith there through the chair. I'm not pitting uh, urban against uh, rural uh, East Hanst at all. And anybody that uh, uh, wants a, a paved road, I, I think they should get a, if, if, if they can get a paved road, that would be a good thing. I'm just saying that in this scenario, uh, we have uh, an urban community with a bunch of gaps, uh, paved roads that 
it's, it's not a very good situation. And the municipality um, wants to get it cleaned up. And a lot of the residents want to get it cleaned up. And uh, the staff brought this forward. And uh, I, th I think it's a good motion. Okay, Councillor Head, to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To the amendment, the fund is coming out of the general rate, uh, which is $150,000, and the amendment says about $60,000. So that's $90,000 that's coming uh, better than the general rate. We're in a pandemic right now, and I know there's a lot of people out there that are struggling, and for them, the extra cost would certainly be added to them. I can't see the provincial government ever increasing their their portion of it. So it's going to be left up really to the taxpayers, the residents of that here is going to come up with the extra cost. And where this fund has been there for a number of years, and that that's what this fund is for. And uh, as Councillor Musa has brought up, you know, maybe we, we may we have to use that in the rural part of the area too as well. I think this is, a, is something that's been going on ever since I've been here on council. And and I think this is a chance to get it cleaned up and, and we have to watch out by putting these bills on these residents. Um, a lot of the reasons why is it's never been, the petitions are never passed because they don't usually use the road. It's other people that's in the, in the whole subdivisions that use it more than them. So I think we have to give a little bit of compassion here to the residents uh, to drop from 150 down to 60. Uh, it's gonna put an awful increase on the bill going to them. And I think at this time of the pandemic, and I know they got 10 years to pay it, but uh, still that's a lot of money. So uh, I will not be in support of the amendment. Okay, seeing no one else, be looking for the question on the uh, amendment. Mr. Chairman, yes, on the sir. amendment. Um, I, I think I um, just need to, before we vote on the amendment, um, to add some clarification as to why the, the amount was higher than 10%, because we did have that discussion. Um, historically, Council has had other projects where they've contributed more than 10% to these types of projects. Um, ones that come to mind are McMillan Drive. Uh, Council contributed 20% to the paving of that road. Um, and really, that was for the greater social good, um, where that road leads to a school. Um, the amount paved was, or paid for pavement, was in recognition that the greater community um, benefited from that pavement. And the other two examples that come to mind are um, where the municipality in the past had not serviced um, areas that were sort of came together. So where Enfield met and where en Elmsdale met Enfield um, and Kaylee Lane was not serviced through both of those uh, systems, uh, council did contribute some general tax rate funds uh, for that project because again, it was for that greater good of filling in those gaps that by our development policies over the years um, didn't get filled in to start with. So there was some rationale behind picking a different number than 10%. Um, and I just, I wanted to share that with councillors because not, not everyone was around when those projects were debated by council. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Tingley. In, in light of that information, uh, is it possible to amend the motion back to $150,000 contribute? No, it is not, Councillor. If this, if the amendment fails, your motion, your original motion will stand. If the amendment passes, then it will be shifted. That's it. Right. Yeah. So we're gonna, so, okay. We, we will be voting on the amendment first, and if it passes, then the original motion instead of 150 will be 60. If the amendment fails, the original motion will go forward with 150,000. Understood. Be looking for a question on the amendment. Question. Questions been called on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment signify by raising your right hand and saying aye and keep your hands up, please. Okay, we have four in favor, five, one, two, three, four, five in favor, six in favor. The motion has failed. The amendment has failed. So now I'll be looking for a question on the amended or on the main motion. Question. Question is called just a second, Warden, you're muted. Would, would it have failed when you include, much as I'd like it, we have to include the numbers of the public members in the total to determine. It has failed, yeah. No. 
Now, question on the motion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 One, two, three, four, five, six, two, four, five, six. Well, now the main motion has failed. I believe all the nays, raise your hand, please. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The main motion has failed. Mr. Chair, could we have the names uh, read aloud for the recording, please? Okay, the nays is myself, Warden Rolston, Councillor Knockwood, Councillor Musa, Councillor Rhino, Councillor Perry, and I believe there was a public member. Did you vote nay on that, either one of the public members? And the public member, Balcom. Thank you. I believe that is seven, is it not, Shirley? That's correct. Okay, so main motion has failed. Gordon Rolston. I don't want folks to think I'm against the GAP project, I'm not. So I would like to make a motion that staff bring a further report on the GAP project um, scenario two, outlining possible alternatives to funding this gap. Moved by Warden Rolston. Are you second on that, Councillor Rhino? Yes, but I'd like to say something, please. Yeah, okay. Go ahead, Councillor. Uh, I'll second the motion, but I'd like to see some, either some fo good photos or some videos along to better than that map, please. Yeah, I believe that is going to happen, Councillor. So, Councillor Knockwood, to the motion. You're, You're muted, muted Councillor. Yeah. Uh, now, can now the motion? Can we include like Mount Uniac areas? Because uh, uh, you know, I think uh, the whole entire. Um, Mr. Pelly should benefit off this, you know, the gap road I, projects. I, I can't speak for Mount Uniac, not familiar. I don't believe there are any road gaps there. No, now, no Mr. Councillor Musa, Councillor Perry, not to my knowledge. Okay, I thought there was. Okay. okay. Until now, we don't, but we, we would soon, probably. Okay, so, okay. Uh, okay. Councillor Perry. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm not against, uh, like, like the warden says, against getting rid of the gaps, but we do have policies and procedures, and if we don't follow them, then there's no real point in having them. Um, however, I do, I do also think that, you know, as much as we're talking about it here, um, we need to also hear, uh, you know, from the public in that, in that, in that area. Are they going to be okay with this being imposed on them, right? Because, you know, it is tough times right now, and imposing uh, no matter what the fee is, whether it's three or eight or two, sometimes imposing fee of a $50 can be the breaking point for somebody. So I would like to see as part of, you know, staff's report coming back is, is a, a little bit of consultation with the people that are going to be affected. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perry. Councillor Hebb. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you uh, to Mr. Mr. Perry, petitions have already been taken and the petitions, they certainly said that they don't want to pay any extra for it. And that's what's, what the problem is for the last number of years. And it's come to the point that that uh, we have a council have to make a decision to to rectify some of these problems. And, and um, you know, yes, it's gonna be a cost to them, but like I said, if we could get some money from the general tax fund would help pay for that. And, and a lot of people in the quarter, you know, they pay general tax too. So um, that's why I would like to see the scenario two go through. But anyway, thank you. Thank you, Councillor, Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, true you, sometimes, and it's not always all the people who have refused it, but not enough to, uh, to carry it through. And as you say, it is a problem that uh, we've just kind of carried over and carried over, maybe not myself, but I've been hearing about gap roads for a long time as I lived in Alderney Drive. Um, you know, if we, if we petition people on who wanted to pay an extra uh, levy for a rink that they never enter, um, you know, if, if we go down that road, 
but I realize that this is directly impacts. One thing I'll say about Boyd Avenue as a resident of the very top end of Alderney is there are, there are dozens and dozens, if not a hundred uh, people who use that exit who don't live on it. So I definitely think in going forward, hopefully with another uh, little study on this, that in that situation in particular, that that, uh, that, that uh, tax could be spread out among all the residents that use it because it is a really large number in that particular incident. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gordon Thank Cole. You. Councillor Musa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So those, those residents have been petitioned twice, three times, and they refuse it. They're the one who live on those roads. They're the one who's collecting the dust from those roads. And they're happy with it because they cannot afford to do it. So to please the other people that want to use those roads without going through a, a one bump here and one bump there and one pothole here and make those people pay for it. I don't think it's, I don't, I don't think it's fair. I think it's fair that if you want to fix that problem, everybody who live in the area should pay because to impose $3,000 on somebody who doesn't want it just to please somebody that gone, gone on this road all the time and doesn't want to pay for it. I don't think that's, that's fair. That's a good reason to pay it. I think if you want to fix a problem, everybody should be the whole, like the whole, the whole area should pay for it because anybody who uses this road should be pay, pay for it. Like they're not collecting the dust. They're just using it. And the people who are collecting the dust and living through it all the time, they don't want to pay for it. I think that's, that's my point. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Musa. Seeing no one else, I'll be looking for the question on the motion. Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. All in favor of the motion signify by raising your hand saying aye. Aye. And the motion, are you in favor, Councillor Tingley? And the motion has passed unanimously. Mr. Chairman, can I get a point of clarification? Yeah, see uh, the motion states that it will go back and staff will come with a with some more options on how to pay for the uh, for scenario two with some right. different options of C payments. Councillor Perry had mentioned that he would want um, consultation done. I'm not sure how we would do that before we bring a report back uh, because we have no information to go out to the public with. And normally that would be in that petition process, but we're not even close yeah. to that. Right. Councillor Perry, do you want to offer some insight in your thoughts? Yeah, my 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 thoughts were I, I'm not looking for like a public meeting or anything on this. It's just it's, I, I, I think part of the uh, like what Councillor Musa put forward and what uh, what Councillor Garden Cole put forward is the, the larger number of people that are using it mm -hmm. should be considered uh, in a proposal. I don't know whether it's a local area rate or an improvement charge or or whatever um, to make it a little more. Uh, fair for for that area to benefit from and mm -hmm. and you know you 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 widen you widen it out and yeah like councillor Hebb said you know everybody pays general tax funds and uh, if it's a larger group of people it's a it's a lot easier to to divvy out a lot more mm -hmm. uh, mon, 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 money but it's it's we're in the middle of a pandemic with massive inflation rising house cost. I've received 10 calls in the last three days about tax assessments and about tax bills, imposing 3000 or more dollars on people that have already said they don't want it, I think is, it could be a little hasty. Anyways, that's, that's just my thoughts. I'm not looking for any public meetings or, or anything like that. Just so, taking in, taking their comments in and maybe in the report, the previous petition comments that they, that they provided with justification of maybe why they said no in the past. Just that, that, that would be enough. The information should be on file. We don't need to go out and get any new information. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Councillor Perry. Councillor Tingley. I just wanted to say again, like this, this situation is situational. Um, and I, I, Councillor Perry raises a good point going out to uh, uh, other uh, residents in the area, but they've already paid their road frontage. And uh, I'm, I'm it's pretty hard to go back to them uh, and, and ask them uh, to contribute, but you know maybe that's that's what we'll end up doing. Um, the uh, and we've already heard that um, that uh, other situations where 
the municipality has contributed more than 10%, 20% or whatever. Um, what do you say to these residents that would like to get their gap uh, uh, re repaired, you know, when, when this was, when, when we're hung up on 10% seemed to be a, a big factor here. Um, what do you say to the residents here uh, when we've already contributed 20% somewhere else? We'll have anybody? those factors in the through you, Mr. Chair. We can have all those factors taken into consideration in various scenarios in the report we bring back. Thank you. Well, you done, Councillor? You have a rebuttal there? Or? I, have, I have no rebuttal. I totally accept it. But I, I just wanted to point out that, uh, you know, one of the arguments for not voting for this uh, was the 150 versus uh, 10%. Uh, and, you know, we just heard that it's been done elsewhere. Like, how does that become an argument here? Uh, and I'm willing to wait to see what comes back, but I, ju I just can't believe we didn't resolve this, uh, you know, for the, the size of the matter. That's all, Councillor. Warden Rolston. For you, Mr. Chair, just to comment that that illustrates the dangers of going outside of Council's policies on how to fund things. Because once you have a good project that seems worthy of support and you go outside that funding policy and you fund more, then folks think you have set a precedent. And then it unfortunately becomes, well, this project is as good as that one, it should get more too. This project is as good as that one, it should get more too. And I would suggest that if council feels the policies that we have in place are not adequate, that perhaps that's what should be reviewed. Um, I never believe that making one exception to a policy or two should set precedent for doing it every time something happens. But that's the conundrum we find ourselves in and trying to justify why one project was more deserving than, an, than another. And that's, that's the hesitancy around going outside of the policy. And if the policy needs to be reviewed, so be it. But, uh, Anyway, th those are just my comments on, on answering those questions. I've been here a long time and I would have to go back and review um, the uh, circumstances because they don't spring immediately to my mind as to when or how it happened. I was here, I probably should remember it, but over 24 years, I don't remember every single discussion. I'm not as young as I once was, but I do support getting the road gap done. There may be some other creative way of funding it. Um, I don't know, but the, it was problematic to explain to folks why we were going with a lump sum of $150,000 when we really had no, no supporting reasons as to why we should go with that amount instead of the amount in the policy. So those are my concerns. And it's a tough one for me because I do wanna see these road gaps paved, I really do. But I still wanna be able to answer my residents when they call and ask me questions. I still wanna be able to give them the consistent answers as to why things are done the way they're done. Okay, that concludes this discussion. We'll move on to the next one. Next up, we have protective fencing for construction sites, bylaw P-900-1, and amendment to bylaw P-900, building bylaw. And Debbie, you're on tap for this one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, 
At their October 2020, 2021 meeting, Council passed motion C21317 to direct staff to prepare a report to investigate options to secure construction sites. The motion stemmed from complaints that had been received regarding construction sites that were unsecure or where fencing had fallen down around the construction site. In response to Council's direction, amendments are being proposed to the building bylaw to regulate protective construction site fencing. As part of planning, sta planning staff's research on um, construction site fencing, or hoarding as it's sometimes referred to, staff reviewed regulations from Halifax and Toronto. In both cities, fencing is part of a much more comprehensive set of regulations on construction site standards. Halifax uses an administrative order respecting construction management and requires construction companies to submit a construction management plan to address items identified in the order. Toronto has a municipal code related to building construction and demolition that regulates construction site fencing. Um, planning staff suggest the level of regulation and detail in these two documents are not necessary for East Hans. And I did reach out to a couple other um, jurisdictions. So I reached out to the town of Truro and to the city of Moncton and neither one of those um, communities had any regulations in regards to construction site fencing. For the single issue of protective construction site fencing, staff feel that amendments to bylaw P900 building bylaw should be sufficient. Protective fencing would be required to be erected where it has been determined to be necessary prior to a building permit being issued. And if the fencing was to fall down, um, we could use the MGA to issue a SOT. The municipal solicitor has reviewed the proposed regulations. So the following two definitions are proposed to be added to the bylaw. A commercial construction site means a construction site where the use of the property containing the construction construction site following the completion of the construction work will either be will be either a multi-unit dwelling over four units or a commercial institutional building over 230 meters squared or a combination of both. Construction fence means a fence required to be erected on a commercial construction site under the provisions of this bylaw. And then under the section 4.7 of the bylaw, uh, it says that a building official may, if applicable, withhold a building permit until satisfied that the following requirements have been met. And uh, so that would be H, construction fence has been installed on a commercial construction site where municipal water and or wastewater services are available. And when the commercial construction site is located adjacent to a residential building, sidewalk, walkway, pathway, or other pedestrian link, and shall be installed in accordance with the following provisions. And so we've outlined the provisions here. Um, the construction fence shall be erected and in place on the property prior to commencement of construction work, shall be erected on the property around the perimeter of the construction site so as to fully enclose the construction site, shall be a minimum height of 1.8 meters, shall be built of wood chain link or welded wire panels, shall be built to deter entry to the site by an unauthorized persons, uh, shall be maintained and kept in a sturdy and upright position and shall at all times be well anchored and secure. And uh, the building official may authorize modifications to the construction fencing provisions or satisfy that the proposed modifications meet the intentions of the bylaw and do not compromise public safety. Um, options, so if planning advisory committee and council are not satisfied with the approach that staff have developed, staff can continue to complete additional research and, and develop an alternative method of regulating protective construction site fencing. Alternatively, uh, planning advisory committee and council may decide not to require fencing around construction sites. And the recommendation is that planning advisory committee recommend the council give first reading to bylaw P1, P900-1, an amendment to bylaw P900, building bylaw to regulate protective construction fencing, and below is the recommended motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Debbie. Councillor Rhino. Yeah, uh, so if I can understand this right, then construction fencing would be a four unit that started a four unit complex. Would that be right? That's correct. All right. So, well, not start at a four after over four units. So it would start at the fifth unit. So you can do four units and then would start at the fifth. Four units without a fence. And then yep. after we reach the fifth, then we have to require a fence completely around the construction site, correct? That's correct. All right. So if this motion passes, what are the penalties if somebody does not comply? That's something we don't talk about when, when we create some of the things like this. Is it going to be a cease construction, cease? construction until it's fixed. Uh, how, how is that handled on that? End? So th the way that this bylaw is set up is that um, the, the, the actual fencing has to be put in place prior to 
the applicant receiving a building permit. Mm -hmm. Now, if the fencing falls down, something happens during the during the construction process, we can use the MGA to issue a SOT. Um, at, at some point in time, what we have to do to do is develop, um, they're called a SOT schedule. So it comes up with a, a list of fees for some of our bylaws. Now this process takes a really long time because we have to work with the Department of Justice. So that's why we haven't gone uh, with the SOT schedule at this point in time yet. But we can use the under the SOTs that are available within the MGA. It's just that the that the uh, minimum fee is $237, but you can ticket a person every single day. So, okay. So they can't just uh, say to heck with it. And uh, I'm not, I'll wait for a week till I'm really forced to do this. So they can be SOTed every day. Is, is yes. that correct? Yes. I guess, to me, if it was a dangerous situation, has the building inspector <clears throat> the ability to shut this down until it's rectified if it becomes that way? Um, from the way that the bylaws created, uh, they can't issue a stop work order. Now, they have their own regulations within the building code that talks about safety around um, construction uh, around construction sites. I, I, but I don't know if they have never really used that section before, so I don't know how far it could actually go. But through just, just this bylaw, they can't issue a stop work order. So still- John might be able to give a little bit more because he did talk to um, yeah. building inspectors about this as well. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So at the front end, if they start construction without the construction fencing in place, they won't have a permit because we won't give them a permit. Um, they can get a footing permit. They just can't get the full permit until they put the construction fencing in place. Um, at that point, we could issue a stop work order because they don't have a permit. It, it, mm -hmm. It's sort of they, they, the fencing leads to the permit. The lack of the permit leads to a stop work order. Yes. Um, yes. But no, we checked with the solicitor and we can issue a stop work order just for the lack of fencing. So for yeah. the lack of fencing if, or if it went down and it's a dangerous situation, that dangerous situation could and then workers could keep on going and, and the danger situation could remain. And I guess really for the lack of safety, you know, that, that is a safety issue. And, and uh, I can give you a ticket, but if you're not gonna fix it, the safety issue still remains. So uh, for, so I'm just wondering, thinking more so about small children, you know, you know being with the, what they may and inquisitive, you know, there and especially in an, in an urban build up area. So uh, those are just some of my thoughts. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you, so, you know, we've all discussed this and um, the example that I'll use is the uh, um, development going on on Highway 2 in Enfield, where at the time that this was brought to our attention, it, it was fenced probably 80%, but the opening to it, which is right on the sidewalk was open. Um, no one had been there in some time at the construction site. There was a foundation dug and it was full of water. So it was literally a tragedy waiting for some uh, inquisitive child to come along um, and reached out to the developer numerous times and came back with nothing. And finally, he put a bungee cord across to hold it, which in no way is secure. Um, so now the most recent development at that particular site, who once again, there's been no development there in months, it's at a standstill, is they came last week and took all their fencing down. So now it's just the development in mid stage with their foundation full of water and no fencing. And it seems like they're beyond reproach. Debbie? Um, so you, Mr. Chair, and the director can confirm with me, but um, the, we do have the danger and, danger and dangerous and unsightly premises. And I know when I talk to the city of Moncton, that's what they use for situations where they have something where um, that is particularly dangerous and the construction company hasn't resolved that issue, that they use their dangerous and unsightly regulations through the MGA. And I, I think we could use something similar in this situation, John, I don't know. Um, through th you, Mr. Chair, we could. I mean, um, it, it's a bit of a clunky tool, but it's why it's better to have clear rules of where fencing is required. So I, I think this is a good change to the bylaw. But 
yeah, any dangerous situation on a property, we could use the MGA, the un dangerous or unsightly premises provisions. Okay, because uh, you know, I'm I'm liking what I'm reading there, and I appreciate what was done up. I'm 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 assuming that when you say that it, you use the word secure at the bottom end of that, that you're meaning like secure at the end. I know you might have meant secure as in you know standing securely, but also secure at the end of the workday when when the construction site is vacated. Um, but yeah, we don't want to be setting up rules that we aren't able to to enforce. So that will be that includes secured at the end of the day, doesn't it, John? When they leave the work site, um, Debbie. Would say... um, so what it says is uh, shall be kept up in times to be anchored and secure. That's referring to the fact that the the, the fencing won't fall down. What we would say so that. Um, shall be built to deter entry to the site by unauthorized persons. So that would mean that the site has to be secured as in locked or something like that at the end of the night. Okay, I'm, I'm happy David. with that. Thank you. Uh, Warden Rolston. Thank you. I think this is a good start, but I don't think it goes far enough. And with regards to using dangerous and unsightly to remedy the situation as it is now, that doesn't work because it's not fast enough. <coughs> By the time we go through that process, they could have finished the building and moved on. So I understand that under this bylaw, the building inspector could not issue a stop work order. Can we create a bylaw where the building official could create a stop work order and issue a fine at the same time? And because I'm hearing we don't know, you know, it's gonna take some time before we can figure out how much to find them. So this isn't really helping us right now, even if we pass it, because obviously anyone who is in breach of this bylaw, we don't know how much to find them. And another issue I have is that you withhold the building permit, which is fine, but often the dangerous situation would start when they put the footings in, when they excavate and put the footings in. So I think we need something that covers it right from the get-go. And there must be something under the MGA that would allow us to do that. Abby? Um, to you, Mr. Chair, just to clarify, a stop work order is only issued through the building, National Building Code. That's how um, uh, building inspectors can do that and through the Nova Scotia Building uh, Act. So that's how they can issue stop work orders. In relation to um, SOTs and their schedules and their tickets, so the MGA has the ability for bylaws to issue SOTs. It's a fee of $237, it doesn't matter what it is. But um, what I'm referring to in, in relation to a SOT, SOT, SOT schedule is a summary offense ticket schedule. We have to work with the Department of Justice and to develop that SOT schedule. So it's, it's just, it's not that it's hard, it's just that it's a, it takes a long time to actually create that schedule and get it into the bylaw. And it was my understanding that um, that council had wanted the these regulations put in place at an earlier time. Um, the other thing when it comes to clearing land is that the land use bylaw doesn't have any regulations indicating that developers can't clear or prepare their land for the development. So essentially um, anybody, whether you're building a house or a commercial development or, or whatnot, you have the ability to go out, clear your land and prep it for construction, whether that's um, digging a hole or, or not. Um, we'd have to probably amend the land use bylaw, John, if we wanted to put in something in regards to not clearing land ahead of time. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, yeah, you, or you have a breaking soils permit process the way some other municipalities do. Well, if I'm still on. Uh, no, uh, no, you're not. You're, okay. you're way down now, Sandra. <laughs> no. Morden Rolston, you still have the floor. Well, I'm... I smiled to myself when I saw that we compared uh, the city of uh, Toronto and who was it HRM? I forget oh. now. As to what they did, and we and I thought, well, no, we don't need what they do, but maybe we do. And I understand that they both offer under operate under different charters than we do, 
And I think we should perhaps pass this, but I would see this as a starting point only. I don't think it goes far enough. We've had one example now where we're in an exposed situation or our, our people are in an exposed situation and we don't appear to be able to do anything about it in a timely manner. And I just, you know, what governs our dangerous and unsightly bylaw? Could we amend that to be more reactive? Uh, I don't know what the answer is, but I think we need to be able to do more and to be able to do it faster. Because when these incidents take place, if there's no stop work order, and you have a company like this company who simply isn't going to keep the fencing up and is just going to do whatever they want to do. And you can find them 200 and some dollars every day for a hundred days if you want, or 300 days. What are you gonna do if they don't pay it? I mean, you might be able to take them to court and eventually get some money, but that's not going to fix the situation that caused the problem. So, yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I think we need to do something more in depth than this. And that's not saying that I'm going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, this provides probably good protection for most contractors. But I think we need, uh, we need protection for those that are not interested in being good, you know, safe contractors all the time. Those are my comments. Thank you. Councilor Rhino. Uh, I think the warden has said it adequately. We need something that will give us immediate, immediate response and something that can uh, uh, shut things down in an emergency situation. Um, like she said, this is a great start. But I think we really have to uh, get some, put some meat on the bones on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, following up on the warden uh, remarks, uh, I, I don't see any difference between a 12 story apartment building in Halifax and a six story apartment building in Anfield. They both dangerous, they both need to be secured. And one of the idea I have, same as dangerous and unsightly, if you don't secure it, we, we send a company to fence it and we send you the bill. We send the bill to the owner or to the contractor or whoever, whoever want, but we have it in the rules. So I think that's the easiest fix. If you don't do it, we're gonna do it and it's gonna cost you more. Oh, well, Councillor. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Garden Cole. Actually, it's just been said by my fellow councillors. Thank you. Thank you, councillor. All right. Seeing no one else, is somebody going to uh, move the motion? Do you want to send it back with staff to come back next month, perhaps with some updated uh, language in it? What is your wishes? Councillor Rhino. I would move that this be sent back to staff to come back that will uh, give, uh, bring something that we can consider for immediate response on issues such as brought up today. Thank you. We have a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Knockwood. Debbie, you wish to speak? Yeah, I think going? John's gonna say the same thing, sorry. Um, three, Mr. Cherry, I, I did wanna say that th there is something that we can do under part 15, that's the dangerous or unsightly provisions of the MGA, where we perceive there's an immediate life safety issue. We can without without coming to council or, you know, the usual time involved with our orders, we can take immediate action. Um, that I guess the, the issue that we have is we don't have any standards right now for fencing around construction sites. Once this is in place, I think that'll help us in making those determinations whether we should take immediate action or not. Thank you, John. Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to staff. So if this, I guess what I'm wondering is what is our what could our immediate action be with the immediate situation that is taking place mm -hmm. as we speak? Um, as uh, three of Mr. Chair has stated, we could engage a contractor to secure a construction site and send that bill to the property owner. 
and and with what we have in place currently or what we are going to put in place, we would be have the ability well, to do that. Th through you, Mr. Chair, we can do that now, but um, I guess the trouble we have is that we don't have any standards for what we consider a safe construction site right now. So, so you know, if somebody uh, digs a shallow um, uh, excavation to put footings in, um, at what point does it become da dangerous? Um, you know, if it's four feet deep or six feet, like if there's no, I, I guess there hasn't a lot of, been a lot of thought put into this. What, what constitutes a dangerous site? All right. Kim, would you want to weigh in here? I do. I think the 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 question really for under dangerous and unsightly is that what constitutes a danger and what would council um, agree constitutes a danger? Because I'm the one who has to sign off on, you know, go erect a, an eight thousand dollar fence and send the property owner the bill. And I'm not really inclined to do that unless I have some real concrete backing from council that that is something council is going to support. So I think if you have those um, discussions maybe next month about um, what it, what does council consider dangerous and what do you want us to act on because that is a sort of an immediate action that we wouldn't be consulting on. Uh, sometimes you might agree with us and sometimes you might not. So again, getting that guidance from council as to when you want us to act would be important uh, going forward. Yeah, Warden Rolston. Yes, through you, Mr. Chair, I'm prepared to support um, Councillor Rhino's motion to bring back a report or further information next month, but I don't think that precludes us giving first reading to this, and then at least we're partway along the road should we decide, giving first reading doesn't make it so, but should we decide that this is part of the solution, it moves us more quickly towards that. So I will be supporting the motion on the floor, but I will then be moving the motion to give this first reading just simply to give us a leg up on the process. Thank you. Thank you, Warden. All right, seeing no one else, I'll be looking for a question on the motion. Questions have been called. All in favor, signify raising your right hand saying aye. Aye. And the motion is passed unanimously. Warden Rolston. And I would move the recommended motion that Planning Advisory Committee recommend to Council that they give first reading to bylaw P-900-1, an amendment to bylaw P-900, building bylaw to regulate protective construction fencing. Second. Moved by Warden Rolson, seconded by Councillor Musa. Any discussion? I would just weigh in with a comment that uh, I'm, I think, uh, the same as the Warden. When you dig a hole to put the footings in, your fence should be up because that's your hole, not just to be able to go in and dig a hole, put a footing in, and then walk away from it. I mean, that's uh, that doesn't make a bit of sense to me at all. So, anyway, question has been called. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And that is passed unanimously. On to the next item. Plan update, floodlands background paper, and that's up for Rachel. Go ahead, Rachel. Sorry, I'm having some technical diff difficulties here. I'll just be a second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so flooding is a natural event that can occur for a variety of reasons in Nova Scotia, including heavy rainfall, snowmelt, ice jams, high tides and storm surges. And the occurrence of flooding in Nova Scotia has resulted in the development of a statement of provincial interest regarding flood risk areas, and that's administered by uh, municipal affairs and housing. East Hans has major, uh, multiple major rivers and waterways flowing through it, which has taken, and has taken steps in the current planned area regarding flood proofing and development management. 
Uh, so in 2013, there was a floodplain study for the Shubanakri River and a portion of the Naimar River. And this was an update of a previous uh, floodplain mapping study. And those uh, new floodplains um, lines were incorporated into 2016 uh, plan updates or plan. Uh, several major rivers in the planned area in East Hans are not covered by this floodplain study. Um, and council have taken steps to ensure that the riparian zone around these waterways remain healthy by implementing the watercourse green belts. And that in addition to um, maintaining the health of the rivers does act to protect properties along that watercourse green belt um, from flooding. And these have been established. Uh, the water pulse green belt is a buffer from 30 meters from the Sackville, Shubenacadie, Naimar River, uh, Meander, Beaver Bank and Herbert Rivers, and then also Ryan's Creek, Black Brook and Barney's Brook. And these are areas which are not covered by floodplain mapping. And then currently in the water course green belt zone, uh, the development is restricted to passive recreational opportunities conservation related uses and development that is specifically related to the provision of pipe service, uh, municipal services. And then there, there are also regulations with regards to setbacks from watercourses and depending on the width of the watercourse um, impacts the, the setback that's required. And there's also a setback from lake shores. And staff have undertook a, a review of um, town of Kentville and the municipality of Cumberland um, and their flood requirements and that's been included in the staff report. So an assessment has been completed on what the land uses are adjacent to the five uh, more major rivers in the future planned area, the Walton River, Tenacape, East Knoll, Five Mile and Kennecook rivers. Um, so you can see there the different uh, land uses break down within the 30 meter buffer of those rivers. So during the plan update open houses and part of the survey, staff received feedback regarding the protection of environmentally sensitive lands. And some of the comments from residents have been provided in the staff report, but the plan update survey, survey did identify that almost 70% of residents who responded to the survey from the future planned area selected that environmental preservation should have strong regulations. Approximately 25% responded that um, environmental preservation should have average regulations. And there was around 5% that suggested limited regulations. So just to note that uh, that, was, that, that was just the people that um, responded to the survey and doesn't include all of the people within the future planned area. And then responses from the open house and the plan update suggest there is a strong interest from the community for environmental preservation. So planning staff recommend that the watercourse green belt zone, which um, I've just mentioned, we also implemented along the Walton, Tenacape, East Knoll, Five Mile and Kennecook rivers. And this uh, water post green belt will enable protection of properties from the risk of flooding, protect the quality of water, control sedimentation and erosion, and will also help to maintain the rural character. And there is a copy of the regulations in this presentation, but just a note there that it allows for passive recreation, conservation related and development specifically related to the provision of municipal services. Um, there is a stretch of the Shubanakri River located from the start of the river at the Minas Basin through to South Maitland. And that's been included in the Fundy Shore Vulnerability Study Area. So there may be some other regulations that might be appropriate for those. Um, that stretch of the river, but we'll, we'll know more once the vulnerability study is completed and, um, and a report is presented to Planning Advisory Committee on that report. And here are the regulations for the watercourse green belt, and this has been included in the staff report as well. And there's a map here that just shows you the rivers that are proposed for these watercourse green belts to be applied, and that it would also include the Shubanakri River. Um, I'm not going to name them all because I've already mentioned them, but they're all there on, on the map. The smaller waterways and then uh, to ensure protection of the smaller ones, the recommend, staff are recommending that regulations from the general provision of the land use bylaw be adopted into the future planned area. So they could, this would just mirror what's in the current planned area of the municipality. And the recommendation is to authorize staff to prepare amendments to the policies and regulations based on the direction in this staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Warden Rolston. 
Thank you. Through you to staff, just a couple of things. Uh, you're not going to survey too many groups of people that aren't going to generically say, yes, we support, uh, you know, we, we support protecting the environment and, and so on. I'm, I'm also pretty sure that a lot of the people who support protecting the environment probably do in many cases, but I don't think they would understand that that would include regulating things like this as part of it. That, you know, would be a more in-depth discussion. Having said that, you know, it, 30 meters doesn't seem particularly excessive to me, but my concern is that in many of these areas in the unplanned area, there are already structures. There are already um, things built and anything we do, I don't want to see us hamstring ourselves such as we were in the high risk floodplain uh, for the former doctor's office. The building was there, it used to be a house, it's not being used as an office anymore. And it was extremely difficult to be able to allow an alternative use for that property, which I don't want to be in that position. So my first question is if we do this, can we have some type of regulation? I know what's there now is grandfather, but can we have something in there that permits uh, snappers in Kennecook from doing some renovations? Um, you know, I don't know how far from the river those apartments are. Like, I don't want to negatively impact what's already there and their ability to continue on with their plans. That's my first question. And uh, Rachel? We have a yes, uh, I'll just go through to the watercourse green belt. So we do have, if you can see here, 10.41. It does allow for permanent structures. Um, uh, it does allow for accessory buildings, basically, that are, are accessory to um, the main use on the property. But we could certainly look at, at how we might be able to um, address existing uses um, and how, um, I guess I understand what Councillor Rolston is trying to get across there, not hamstring in those existing um, property owners, uh, but we can look at how, that, how to address that in the regulations. That would certainly, um, certainly be appreciated. Now these, uh, and I see you are allowed with accessory structures. So would that allow things such as boat houses, docks, that sort of thing? Um, I mean, in the if you, it's no good to have a boat house hundred feet from the water. I, I guess it would come down to whether a boat house is considered an accessory structure to a dwelling. Um, John, do you have a an? Would yeah, you consider it, that to be an accessory structure? It, it would be. Um, and they're specifically permitted, for example, around the lakes and the lakeshore residential zones. So I, I don't think it would be any different in, in this zone. You, if you had a residential use area, you could have a boathouse. Okay. And docks wouldn't come under this regulation anyway. That's uh, They don't need a building permit. But it's a structure, and you're saying you yeah. can't have a permanent structure. The devil is in the details. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we should go this route, I will be expecting to see something there that addresses that before I vote in favor of it at the end of the day. Those are, are my comments there. Um, I don't know, um, yeah. How would it be addressed? We're, we're into different discussion now, but knowing of an existing situation, what about a situation where it's a non-permanent structure? What about a situation when some folks haul a half a dozen camper trailers right along the river bank or the edge of a lake and they set them up and they're not permanent structures? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I mean, that, that use would be considered, I think, a campground. Um, it sounds to me, um, like it wouldn't be permitted because it, it's not a, it's the use that wouldn't be permitted in that case. It's not accessory to a residential use. It sounds to me um, like a campground use. 
Again, I say the devil was in the details. Mm -hmm. So those are my comments for now. Thank you. Councilor Rhino. Uh, it's almost uncanny how the warden and I are thinking today. Uh, right along the same issue, you've got snappers there. I don't want to see anything put in that that would uh, stop them from uh, maybe outside patios or, or whatever. We also have on the other side of the river, you know, we have a, a, a just a, you know, an impressive private museum, I'll call it there, by Mr. Anthony there that uh, I encourage anybody to, to meet you know, the effects that it's going to have on those. Uh, we talked about somebody along the river river there that has a cabin or a cottage, you know. You know, are we thinking about this? Uh, you know, for lack of better things, we're going to do the same thing to the Kennecook area that we're, we did in Shubenacadie, which I was not in favor of. And has any consideration been given to how that will affect uh, property assessments and, and uh, insurance values and things like that when we go and we put start on with regulations as such as we're heading down the road for. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Lockwood. Okay, um, okay, there we go. Um, you say 30 meters on both sides of the river or the Shubenacadie? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So the Shubenacadie River, only one side is is in East Hants. The other side would be whatever the municipality was on the other side. Oh, um, yeah. Sorry about that. Of course, yes, that's correct. But um, can I get an overview of what 30 meters is, actually is? Um, on the east hand side of the river of Shibanakati in the village of Shibanakati. Can I get an over like in District 4? So um, three, Mr. Chair, so that the, uh, the floodplain mapping goes up to approximately where the 102 crosses over. Um, and then from there upwards, it's the watercourse green belt. If, if the, I, I'll just um, leave the presentation for a second and bring up my mapping program so I can show. Yeah. The reason why I'm saying this is um, the doctor's office seems way farther than 30 meters. Uh, through Mr. Chair, that's that's actually within the floodplain. Um, this is a different thing. The, the floodplain was identified based on modeling and surveys of the river and a number of different things that the consultant did to identify where those flood lines should be located. What we're talking about here is the watercourse greenbelt, where we these are areas where we don't know where um, we don't have information on where, where flooding might occur. So we're asking for or recommending a 30 meter buffer um, and say that in some areas, the flooding area might be further than the 30 meters. It might be less, but we just don't know. So we've got this 30 meter buffer. But um, I can bring up the map to show other areas where this 30 meter buffer has been applied yeah. so you can kind of get a feel for yeah. what that looks like. Well, I didn't hear the, the extension of the flood flame so I just going on what I heard and what I read here in this report so. Um, so can you see the, the, the map on the screen there? Yeah. Um, yes. So you can see here, uh, this, this little kind of light green color is the buffer, the watercourse green belt. And this is the 102, and this is the very edge of the floodplain mapping just here. So then from that point onwards, along the Shubenacli River, we have this watercourse green belt. And, and so three, Mr. Chair, the proposal would be that would extend up further. So. Rachel, if you could scroll up, you can see where it ends, uh, where zoning ends. There is no buffer beyond that point. Yes. Uh, would that be on the, on the other side of 102 uh, towards District 5? Or I don't think that's Shubenacadie. Shubenacadie is just, is just south of here. I'm, I'm just scrolling up the map here to show you where the edge of the watercourse green belt runs. Um, So you can see here it extends along this portion and then it continues up the Shubenacadie River. 
um, if I zoom out too much, you won't be able to yeah, see. Yeah, you. Uh, essentially, it goes up to where the edge of the um, uh, the oh, unplanned, well, unplanned well, area we, is. The, the, we are the Shibanaki, the village of Shibanaki yes. now. You're in Malone right. Road, you're way up Ryan's Creek and uh, further. Three, Mr. Chair, this was just to show you that what that watercourse green belt looks like. In Shubanakadi itself, uh, yes. it, we're, we're, we're looking at the, this the floodplain that's been implemented. So the watercourse green belt doesn't apply to the sh village of Shubanakadi. It's south of the 102 is um, floodplain zoning. I'm just going to come back to the Shubanakadi uh, village. So Councillor Knockwood, this is the area that has the floodplain zoning yeah. on it, south of the 102. Yeah, can you go up a little further? I uh, uh, see where where you where you at now. There. Now, now you're by the residential school now. Okay, there it is. So the we have zone. yeah, so it, this the floodplain mapping all the way, it runs all the way down to Enfield. Okay, the lighter blue is the the 30 meters, right? No, that the, this lighter blue, is this the blue we're talking about? Is, is yes. actually the Shubanakri River. Oh, that's the Shubanakri River. Yeah. So through you, Mr. Chair, again, the that 30 meter buffer doesn't exist here because we have detailed mapping. And as you can see, in most cases, it's much further than 30 meters. It's uh, in some cases, it'd be more than 100 meters. So the floodplain extends past Snides Lake, is that, am I correct there? I'm just gonna scroll up again. Yeah, that, that's correct, Mr. Chair. That darker uh, greenish blue color is all high-risk floodplain. High-risk floodplain. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that, that goes a long ways on the river. I think that's too far myself. Now I'm looking at it now, first time I get to see this map. Right up to Mitch's Roads. Okay. okay, thank you, I got it now. You know, uh, that's all, Councillor Knockwood? Yes. Councillor yes. Musa. You're muted, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, John uh, or Rachel, uh, aren't those regulation already in the, the with the Department of Environment, like the thirty meters? Uh, through Mr. Chair, no, these are our um, these are our regulations in our land use bylaw. Yeah, but but uh, I know I know in Mount Uniac with the lakes and stuff like uh, the Department of Environment have a thirty meter setback. Aren't those uh, in in all Nova Scotia or just in certain areas or? I'm, I'm not familiar with the Nova Scotia environment regulations, but in Mount Uniac, there are setbacks, 30 meter setbacks from um, lake shores and, um, and, and uh, the Sackville River as well. But I'm not familiar think, with any environment regulations. I think those, if, if those department of uh, environment have those regulations, so we're not adding anything. Mm. Through, through, you, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I don't think so. I don't. Though, those are municipal zoning regulations. Um, there, there are regulations about forestry operations near water courses provincially, and they have regulations about shoreline alteration and so on. But I don't think they just have a standard thirty meter setback, the way these regulations would require. No, I don't know. But I, I was told by Kelly one day that you cannot. The, the Department of Environment, you have to have acceptance to be able to build closer to the lake from 30 meters, not from us. Uh, three, Mr. Chair, that may be related to a septic system within that 30 meter. There, there may be the a buffer for that. Structure, no, no, the structure. That's what she told me. So I think we're not adding anything of that all across the board, Nova Scotia. Um. We, we can double check, but I don't think that's a provincial regulation. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else for discussion? 
What are your wishes? <clears throat> Is anybody prepared to move the recommended motion? Warden Rolston. Sort of. Pardon? Sort of. Um, I move that uh, planning advisory recommend that council authorize staff to prepare land use policies and regulations for floodlands based on the direction in staff's report dated January 5th, 2022, also taking into account the discussion around pre-existing structures and uh, structures that might not be considered permanent. I have a mover, do we have a seconder for that? Seconded by Councillor Garden Cole. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing not, Councillor Rhino. Just to make sure that these policies will be created and brought back for review. Yes, they'll come back. Will they not, Rachel? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say three, Mr. Chair. That they will. Any policies and regulations that are drafted will come back for review. Thank you. Thank you. Think no one else be looking for the question. Question has question. been called. We'll go to the vote. All in favor? The motion is passed unanimously. On to the next item. Next one, plan update, Mount Uniac Growth Management Area Road Paving Background Paper. John. Hey, uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, so this uh, paper relates to a motion passed uh, by Council um, C-2261, which directed staff to prepare a report on the current growth management area and and should it be revised with regards to paving of roads and new development. And although the motion doesn't mention Mount Uniac, it was clear that that was the discussion at the time we were talking about the Mount Uniac GMA um, and whether um, requiring paved roads as we do now uh, may be discouraging development there. And given that Mount Uniac is the only GMA that is not serviced with municipal sewer and water, it has much lower density. Um, minimum area, for example, you basically get one seventh the number of lots if you're subdividing the same area because your lot standard goes from 500 square meters for an R1 lot in a serviced area to 37, 20 square meters where on-site services have to be used. And your lot frontage goes from 16 to 30 meters. So you have to build almost twice as much road and you get one seventh the number of lots. So that was kind of the economic argument, I guess, that it's obviously um, it can affect the profitability of development, development uh, with unserviced. Uh, and this is just the, uh, to highlight the what we're talking about the, in terms of the Mount Uniac GMA. Um, so it goes from the HRAM boundary, follows Highway 101 up to uh, Westlake, and then follows that uh, up uh, all the way to, um, I think that's Norman Lake and then back down towards the HRM boundary uh, and across Mackenzie Drive. And we've had this discussion a number of times over the years uh, about what standard we should uh, require development to be built to. Um, the current regulations in Mount Uniac have been in place since April 2006, and they do require paved roads in all uh, growth management areas and growth reserve areas while not requiring paving outside of those uh, areas. And the rationale for this is that these areas, whether they're serviced or not, um, uh, these are the areas council is directing growth to. And with that greater development and density comes greater traffic resulting complaints about dust and potholes on unpaved roads. Um, in addition, I, I think there's a counter argument to that. Um, the, and I've heard all the arguments over the years from developers about the ability to make money doing development with paved roads in Mount Uniac. Um, you have to also consider that <clears throat> um, there are all kinds of uh, additional costs that you face when you're developing in serviced areas that you don't face in unserviced areas. So, you know, in a serviced area, you have to install all your own sewer, water, buried storm drains, curbs, street trees, sidewalks, all that's at a developer's cost. Um, in addition, the lock rating bylaw only applies to our serviced areas, and that's typically one to $2,000 extra per dwelling. 
uh, to comply with the lock grading bylaw to actually have a professional prepare it. Um, and you also are required to provide 10% of land uh, for open space as opposed to 5% in the unserviced area. So there are quite a number of differences. Um, and of course, also infrastructure charges only apply to serviced areas, which, you know, at a cost of about $6,000 to an R1 lot. Uh, again, the <clears throat> Um, in an unserviced area, obviously, uh, whether it's a developer or the homeowner, the installation of services on site uh, would more than uh, offset that, of course. And although, again, we've heard complaints about the road pavement requirements in the past, um, in the last few years, I would say in the last two or three years, we've noticed an increased interest in development in Mount Uniac, um, and the road paving requirement really doesn't seem to be as much of an issue, I would say. Um, so there are three current examples uh, I, I can give you. Um, this is called the Orchards. It's a 23 lot subdivision off the Edder Road, which has received tentative approval under a subdivision bylaw. And all those, uh, you'll have two new municipal streets, which will be paved. Um, we already talked about Portree Jack at the beginning of the meeting, and that's a 50 lot subdivision. And again, these will all be future municipal streets that would be paved. And then there's Headwater Village, phase three, uh, which is a 24 lot subdivision off the Old Mines Road. And that's currently in our subdivision approval stage as well. And that would also be a new municipal street uh, paved. <clears throat> so to conclude, if the cost of paving new roads in the Mount Union HMA uh, were a barrier to development in the past, it appears to no longer be the case as evidence in the strong developer interest staff are seeing in the above noted applications and a number of other inquiries that we're receiving. Um, so given this trend and the superior service advantages that paved roads offer to residents, staff are recommending that the existing regulations be maintained. And that is the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. Uh, Councillor Perry. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, John, for that, that report. It's very, infor very informative. And uh, in Mount Uniac, there has been a lot of these developments come forward. And um, in order that for, that for that to happen though, it's basically meant that if you have to sell your land to a bigger developer, somebody with deeper pockets to be able to develop it because the landowner, if it was a family owned land plot, they just don't have the money and the infrastructure up front to do that development. Um, that I guess is the way it's gonna have to go to go forward. And that's what and that's what has happened with all the developments, uh, uh, as we see, especially if you look at the orchards, the orchards started off as a as a family development and they had to sell out to a larger developer because they couldn't afford to put the road in. That's that, that that's what happened there. So that's uh, just the way business, I guess, is going to have to go. Um, one of the questions I do have, though, is if we look at the lot sizing that's required in the on serviced area. Um, with the advances of the last 20 years and the size of septic fields and vertical septic fields and not needing to have always your C3 in a massive area, do, do we, is, is, is there anything that we can relook at at what the actual size and road frontage is required for, for these lots in the on-service area? Because I don't think that uh, the lot sizing um, in some of these areas is, uh, is it's quite large. Um, you know, uh, some of these uh, other subdivisions. If you look at the older, some of the older subdivisions in Mount Uniac up on Rockwell Drive off Uniac Mines Road, um, I guarantee they don't have 30 meters of road frontage um, between their houses. And there's about 200 houses like that going back. And then as the new phases have come on, they've all now abided by the new regulations and the lot sizes are a lot bigger. I, I just don't know if maybe there's a happy medium somewhere in between um, where, you know, the pay, the pay, the paving is a good idea. It definitely has long-term effects. Um, the one thing I'm, I'm a little concerned that I, I, I didn't know, and that, that's on me that lot grading wasn't required in the on-service area. Um, Cause you're going to have water moves across pavement and it has to go somewhere. And elevations from lot to lot can make a huge difference. Um, whether you impact somebody, your 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 neighbor right next to you, you all of a sudden build up, and next thing you know, you're flooding out your neighbor. Um, we've had instances of that, and it's come forward at council from developments historically that have happened within the corridor, and the people are dealing with it day to day of you know a poor drainage plan. Um, I think that's something else that we might need to look at in the future to ensure that those 
those lessons that we learned from older developments in the corridor where paved roads and everything have happened and the movement of wastewater, uh, even if there's no storm system, um, need to be looked at. But uh, that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to add to Councillor Perry's comments, yeah, you're right, uh, Councillor, like only big developer can afford now to put subdivision in there. And uh, John, the two, so I agree with you on some on some areas, like where uh, if you can show the, the subdivision approved, like not the South Uniac one, the one on Rock, behind Rockwell Drive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, so that's part. That's part of a 250-acre development, and they're doing it by phase. But the, the total approved is like 140 houses or 150 houses there. So I, I agree 100% that they, they should be paved. But my, our point is, when when you if you purchase five or or 10 acres and you want to build a road, and you pay for the and and your cost per acre when you buy 10 acres is like more than ten thousand dollars easy compared to when you buy a hundred acre for $200,000, which is $2,000 per acre. So that's all your profit gone there. So you're prohibiting the small cul-de-sac, whatever you want to call them, like uh, dead end street, like probably five, six homes. If you have a property of 10 acres and you want to split it between three or four kids. So if you want to pave it and build the homes on it, you better give it to one and buy the other's property on the other way. Because you won't be making, you won't be saving any money. You're just dividing your property into small pieces. And on the other part, when you said the developers in uh, in the corridor area, out, out of an acre or two acre or out of an acre, they can get seven lots. So if you pay six thousand on each lot, you're still making money, like because six lot will sell for three hundred compared to one lot selling for sixty thousand. So, so you cannot compare those two together. I, I don't know, to me, I cannot compare the, because there's big difference. Plus those lot owners are paying, paying 60 or $70,000 now, they still have to put $20,000 for septic and $10,000 for a well and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's we, we, one, one week we talk about affordable homes and if, you, if the price a lot gonna go up to $100,000 before you start construction, that's not gonna be affordable to even put a trailer on. I heard the trailer on Mount Uniac now on half an acre lake lot is selling for $320,000. So if we want to think affordable, we have to make smaller size lots. I know I have property in Syracuse, just down the road, probably on the other line, on the other side of the line between Halifax County, I could subdivide it and 20,000 acres, the 20,000 square feet lots with sewer, uh, with the septic and well. So I don't have any services. So on one side, we have one acre on, and if, if, even if we put down our requirement to 20,000, it's still gonna pass the uh, per test for the environment. So if you need more, they'll force you to put more like, but the minimum with us should be set lower. And then the Department of Environment could take it from there and suggest what size lot can you put in. I think that's how it works. I don't know if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I, I'm not sure about HRM, but um, I mean, we can look at their lot standard uh, for unserviced development. And yeah, uh, yeah I, I think what we've done over the years, we've just, through you, Mr. Chair, we've just tracked the provincial uh, subdivision regulations. And as you, actually, this development's kind of an interesting one because you can see the changes on the first part of Rockwell Drive. Uh, you know, the lots are much smaller. And then, well. you know, when they got to phase two, they, they went up in size you know, what are those uh, probably five times the size of the original lots. Um, yeah. But but we can look at we can look at that standard to see. I, I mean, obviously, there's more risk of the, the smaller you get your lots uh, in an unserviced area where you have to rely on your own well and septic system. Um, you know, we talked earlier about um, the hydrogeological study. Obviously, the higher the density in an area like this, the more opportunity there is for things like well interference and for failing septic systems. But we, we can certainly look at that if that's a will of uh, council. But we, we are approving permit, we have a permit on a 10, 7,000 square foot lot on a lake now. So the septic is well advanced 
I, I don't know about the water. Probably the water could be a problem, but for, for a septic, I think when we approve 7,000 square foot and we give permit for a septic on a lake in the middle of nowhere, we should be able to, to give 20,000 square feet. So that's my point. I don't know about septic council, what they want or what they want to see in the growth management area. Plus one, one more thing. I, I really have a problem with, with the area itself because on one side you have one street, like let's say Mackenzie Lane. If you can put Mackenzie Lane on, on one side, you could make a subdivision with dirt road. On the other side, you can make, you, you have to pave it. And if you look what happened on the pavement side, I don't think any, any of us want to see some, some development like that. I know it exactly, but I don't know if other council are familiar with it. It's like a bunch of flag lots and a bunch of nightmare between neighbors gonna be. You don't know which, 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 which is your road frontage, which is your neighbor property. So I, I don't think that's what we want in here. We want something nice. We want lots that are squared. Uh, and you're pushing the other way now. I, I think we're pushing the other way. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to comment? What is your wishes on the recommended motion? Councillor Rhino. Oh, you're muted, Councillor. I guess if there's no motion, it remains as this, remains as it is right now. When that's with uh, that greater GMA and Mount Uniac require paved road. So I don't unless there's going to change. I don't see the requirement for a motion. I guess, Mr. Chair, we we put a motion or a draft motion there because. Um, um, there was there was a motion directing us to do something, so this is kind of the conclusion of it. But but you're right, uh, or Councillor Rhino is correct that if there's no motion coming forward, is this the regulations just stay the way they are? Okay. So Councilor actually, Gordon Cole. Whoops. Go ahead, Councillor Rhino. So if anybody wanted to move the motion to be received and placed on file, then there's no motion required. <clears throat> Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, I was just kind of leaning for um, the councillors from the Mount Uniac area to um, to to weigh in on on how they felt about it, and uh, and I'm kind of going to follow their to follow their lead. I guess what you're saying is that if the lots were able to be made a little smaller, then developers could uh, pave pave the road, and it would help to increase their profits while still paving the road. Is that is that what I'm getting? selling more lots, still paving and, and uh, making more of a profit, making it more um, enticing for them. I, like not, sorry. Yeah, I believe that's what Councillor Musa was getting at. I'll let him elaborate there on it. Go ahead, Councillor Musa. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not for a profit, but it's for like, it's for the small lots that the, like the, the family owned lots that want to spread between the like if you have two acres and you have three kids you cannot you cannot pave a road and subdivide it and and do something with it right but uh, i i think i i i agree 100 percent that big subdivision like 50 lots and more or 25 lots or more should be paved but i would like to see staff bringing up something like for small like small stretch like 400 feet lot uh, 400 feet road or something to be able like to keep to keep like family together and stuff so that's what i like to see okay thanks. i don't have a big problem with the big subdivision i don't have problem with the if the developer making profit or not but i'm 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 leaning toward i agree 100 percent with what john said about the big subdivision but my point is is if we can do something about uh, a sm like now, if you have five acre lots and you want to put like 200, you want to pave 200 to get to the next two, then pave another 100. So you have to pave 300 feet to get two, two extra lot of your lots. It's, it's, not, it's not doable and it's not, 
the, the only people that gonna go on this road are the people who live on it. So it's not, it's not a major problem. So that's what I like to see some, some small caveat like here and there to be able to put like small stretches like, like slip, Lady Slipper Lane. It's, it's one perfect example. Like if you wanna pave this, I don't think he would be able to sell any, any lots. So if if so, if we could do something about about yeah. that it would be it would be perfect. So I don't know about Councillor Perry. Most of them in Councillor Perry's district too. So I think he should weigh on too. Councillor Perry, do you wish to weigh in? I'll weigh in. Yeah, there. It's um, it's a difficult one because there's a lot of pre-existing um, gravel roads, private roads um, that people are very happy to live on. Um, they are very happy that, you know, their roads are clear and well graveled and well salted, and they're not going in the ditch like people are on provincial roads right now. So it's it, it, because of the priority, like they're, it's a pay for service. They pay extra for that. And they know that that's a service they get when they live there. As far as, you know, there's been a couple large parcels of land that are going to be developed. There's big developers coming in, putting in big subdivisions. And yes, I totally agree with Councillor Musa. And uh, even the direction that Miss Pally is like, we should have, you know, good paved roads and, uh, you know, adds to a quality of life. There are, there are a number, as you go back to the other paving petitions, there are a number of roads that have multiple paving petitions and the people don't want it paved because the potholes keep people driving slow. They don't want people racing up and down their road. So it's, it's, it's really a, di a difficult thing. It's a fine balancing act. I think right now, um, leaving things as status quo is okay. Uh, but there has to be, as Councillor Musa said, um, something has to be available for that five to 10 acres that a family wants to divide up and have a, a family parcel. Like years and years ago, you would see that. You, I mean, even in the rural area, you know, you divide off four or five acres and give it to one of your kids so they can live close to home. I don't know if we have to have some pro provision that small, small developments like that can happen under development agreements with certain conditions or whatever. But as we grow and as we get bigger, we have to also remember like we're still Hans County and we are a rural municipality as Nova Scotia is considered a rural province. So we have to keep, keep that in mind as well Everybody talks about senior housing and, and developing income, assisted housing. Well, on a big lot size that, that that's required currently now in the, in the GMA, there will be no senior housing being developed in Mount Uniac because it is just too cost. It's too, it's too costly to put the road in to build the size of lots. Um, if, you know, you can't, right, right now, you can't build a tiny home village or, or a little retirement community like that, it would have to require a special development agreement. So it's just, uh, it's, it's a difficult situation, but right now until, until people come forward uh, with questions on things, I think remaining the status quo for now is okay, but we have to have an avenue that people can come forward and ask and, and possibly uh, put a development agreement or a proposal in front of us that council can make uh, a decision on. And I don't know how we do that or what type of legislation we have to enact uh, to make it happen or bylaw or policy. But uh, that's something that is going to affect a lot of people, even in even as we go into the growth area outside of Lance. There's a lot of family, large family plots out there that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, would be restricted under this. So that's all I have to say about that. I see the warden has something to say. Thank you. Uh if I may, Councillor Perry, I believe you are the Vice Chair of uh, Planning. Okay. I'm going to turn the chair over to you. I have to go for the booster. Warden Rolston is the only one on deck. Enjoy Thank the you. rest of your meeting, folks, and I'll see you next Wednesday night. Good luck. Warden Rolston. Uh, thank you. I, I just wonder, um, and John can maybe tell me if it would be appropriate or not, but as staff continue to try and uh, flesh out and create regulations in the current unplanned area, if as kind of an aside, 
they could bear in mind these issues that are being described in particularly the Mount Uniac area and whether or not some of the provisions we might come up with in the current unplanned area. And I understand there's, this is, there's growth management and maybe it's as simple as changing that boundary, I don't know. But perhaps as these regulations are developed, we just kind of keep in open mind as to whether something that was developed there might also work in Mount Uniac. Uh, through you, Mr. Ch Chair, Vice Chair. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I made some notes here and I am curious now about the lot size and frontage requirements as an example. So maybe it's not that we, we get rid of the paving requirement, but we improve the economics of development by looking at those things. So, uh, you know, I'm gonna go away and do a little bit of research on those two issues. Um, other than that, I mean, we can always look at policies to allow us to do um, uh, a development agreement. Uh, so if you want to do some unique kind of development that, you know, you don't feel like you can capture everything in a zone requirement, then that's what development agreements are for. So we, we could also come up with a policy to allow consideration of unique developments that way. Okay, next on deck is Council Tingley. If I had my head up or hand up, I was just to scratch my head. I've, oh. I've got no questions or comments. Oh, sorry. That's it. Anybody else? All right. I guess we'll just uh, file this away. Thank you for the report. And we'll move on to uh, oh, uh, Council Garden Cole. Um, just before you leave PAC, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, excuse me. Um, before we leave uh, PAC, I would just like to... Um, in lieu of what we had discussed regarding the, um, the property at 428 Highway 2, um, I would like to further have that investigated. So I, I would like to make a motion that staff investigate the development at 428 Highway 2 in Enfield and bring back photos for council next Wednesday night to determine if it's immediate safety consideration that council should be acting on. I'll allow it. Go ahead. There's a motion. Seconded by Councillor Knockwood. Is there any discussion? Question. Seeing no discussion, questions of a call. We'll go to the vote. All those in favor? And the votes pass unanimously. Thank you. Warden Rolston. Uh, yes, the CAO had to leave uh, for an appointment and leaving us in the capable hands of Mr. Clarkson. And uh, she did shoot me a message before she went. So I just like to put it out to council that uh, we could, depending on the timing, I know folks may have timed things according to the agenda. We could do PRC on council night or move the, particularly the grant reports and the F400 report could very easily be done at a budget meeting. So just wanted to throw that out there to council and see perhaps what your wishes were. So I'll put it out to uh, the chair of PAC, Councilor Rhino. Is there anything that has to be dealt with immediately today that we could not put off is the role warden to see? Um, I'll take that one uh, through you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, no, the items could be um, deferred uh, at a later date. The, the playground strategy could even go to next committee if council so chooses or committee chooses. And the three items regarding um, community partnerships, general government grants, and bylaw 400 are all budget related items. Um, so they could go to a future budget meeting. So there was nothing, if I may. No. Yes, go so ahead. There's nothing there. So, uh, you know, would be my suggestion if there's nothing pressing between now and we take this down, take this down, defer this to uh, further down the road. All right. Everybody's heard from, from the uh, chair of Parks and Rec. Uh, all those in agreement, raise your hand. All right, looks like we're moving Parks, Recreation, Culture uh, items to future meetings dealing with budget and next Wednesday. So I guess that brings us to the end of our day. So I'll be looking for a motion to adjourn co executive committee. Moved by Councillor Knockwood, Second. seconded by... Councilor Rhino. All those in favor? Aye. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
just stopping. We're just stopping the uh, recording and the live stream.